Good evening and welcome to the May 10th, 2012 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Um, I am North, uh, Mayor David Narkowitz and we begin each meeting with um, the roll call. So I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Sorry, I was in school, uh, city council mode there for a minute. <laughs> Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Mr. Alden Bourne. Here. Lou Duvall. Present. Mr. Michael Flynn. Mr. Downey Meyer. <coughs> Ms. Lisa Minnick. Uh, Sensor regrets. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Stephanie Pick. Here. Mr. Andrew Shelfo. Here. Mr. Ed Zahouse. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you. The first item on the agenda is the public comment period. Is there anyone wishing to speak in public comment? Um, so I have a list. So uh, uh, if you just would come up to the um, podium and if you could just state your name and address for the record and I believe uh, um, Madame James is the first speaker um, good evening my name is Andrea James and I live at 13 Birch Lane in Florence um, I am also a French teacher department chairperson and team leader here at JFK Middle School. Um, minus five years of, of my career, I've, I've been teaching here in Northampton since 19, 1980. Um, I'd like to thank all of you and especially the superintendent and the mayor for the efforts that you're putting into um, restructuring and examining how money is spent in our city. I, I know you're working hard on that and that effort does not go unnoticed in my household. Um, you've received, most of you, my letter about the sixth grade world language program and um, how I believe that it is an absolute gem of a program. Um, I've heard back from some of you and one of you in the hallway just now, and I know that you don't want to make that cut, um, and as of course I don't either. <laughs> Um, one thing I didn't say in my letter that I thought would be important for you to reflect upon, in case you hadn't already thought about it, um, was the impact that cutting sixth grade world language will have on the rest of our world language program. Um, it clearly would impact here in seventh and eighth grade. Uh, it's a six week program, but we get so much accomplished that I think it could put our other courses behind by perhaps even eight weeks, which is two months. Um, this would trickle up, so to speak, to the high school and I think would be detrimental to our learners who struggle as well as to our learners who really excel. I, I fear, I anticipate that it would impact our higher end honors and AP courses as well, um, all of which add to the the rich fiber of our Northampton High School offerings. Um, I've said before to school committee members other years that I think the sixth grade world language program is a very, very valuable one. It costs the city around $50,000 for it, but in my estimation, it's worth about twice as much. We really get a great bang for our $50,000. Um, I respectfully ask you to reconsider the cutting of this program and thank you ahead of time for making all efforts to do so. Thank, thank you. you. The next speaker is Susan Voss. Hi, my name is Susan Voss and I live at 89 Ridgewood Terrace in Northampton. I'm a professor of engineering at Smith College and I have a daughter Erin, who is in eighth grade here at JFK. I sent each of you a letter about three weeks ago, and I'm here to speak about two <coughs> major concerns I have with the proposed math changes at the JFK school. First, I'm concerned about the elimination of the advanced math program currently in place for seventh and eighth grade students. This program has truly been the academic highlight of my daughter's experience at JFK. While I absolutely support the effort to increase math content for all students, the proposed changes will actually decrease the math content for 20% of the students at JFK. And I have yet to hear a sound argument, argument for eliminating advanced math. I ask you to please carefully read my letter for more details on the existing arguments. 
In the end, Northampton should be a leader in providing challenging math curricula to all of its students and should not be lowering the expectations for those who are ready for more challenging work. I don't see any reason that the proposed changes can't be made while retaining the current advanced math program. My second concern relates to the process. Only very recently, parents have heard that teachers and administrators have worked for three years to develop this new math pathway. No parents or students, to my knowledge, have been involved in these discussions. And the attitude has been one of refusing to engage in an open discussion and instead only allowing for a description of what the plan is. Last Thursday night, more than 40 people attended an open forum to learn about the math curriculum changes. And I believe this is the one and only public comment period. It was clear that these changes were moving ahead and the attitude was to squelch any concerns brought forward instead of allowing for an actual discussion. In closing, both of my concerns are supported by the mission of the Northampton Public Schools, which I'll read. The mission of the Northampton Public Schools, in partnership with parents, guardians, and the Northampton community, is to promote and support high achievement by each student. This mission includes both parental involvement and challenging all students, both of which are lacking in the current math proposal. I hope that you, our elected members of the school committee, will ask the teachers to reconsider the opportunities they will provide for our stronger math students. The answers I heard last Thursday night were absolutely inadequate for at least 20% of our students. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Erin Voss. My name is Erin Voss and I live at 89 Redwood Terrace in Northampton. Um, I am an 8th grader at JFK and advanced math is my favorite class. It's the only class that I have that challenges me. Before the math curriculum is changed, I think you should talk to kids in all math classes at JFK about their experiences. I know my friends and I think that it is important to keep advanced math. Thank you. The next speaker is Pearl Silverman. Hi, my name is Pearl Silverman and I live at 20 Aldridge Street, Northampton. Um, I am in eighth grade and I just, I'm almost done with the middle school math curriculum. And I went to the, um, the open speaking forum during, on Thursday night and I asked a question at the end and I didn't get a straight answer. Well, and I don't think many other people did either. And so that's why I'm here. And I remember in sixth grade when everything wasn't leveled, um, I had a hard time like being able to raise my hand and being confident in class because everyone was at different levels. And in seventh and eighth grade, I was so much more confident in raising my hand and everyone was at my same level and could work with me and I just felt so much more confident and ready to like take on the work and I personally don't think that the new middle school math curriculum that is going to happen is a good plan and I'm going to like keep working on talking to everyone because all the people I've talked to so far don't think it's a good idea and um, I, I think that it's not good. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next item is announcements. Are there any announcements? Ms. DeVault. Um, the Ryan Road School uh, PTO is raising money and they're having a starry night auction, which is tomorrow night, Friday, May 11th. It's to be held at the Look Park Garden House. There will be a lot of um, items auctioned off, but there will also be a raffle, and in the raffle, each class has made a class project, whether it be bookcases or um, replicas of Van Gogh or something like that, but they're going to be raffled off. It should be a lot of fun. It'll help raise money for Ryan Rhodes PTO, and um, I hope to see people there. I'll be there. Thanks. Mr. Moore. Yes, my announcement is that uh, this Saturday, um, the 12th, there's the NEF plant sale at Smith Folk from 9 to 1. Any other announcements? Okay, we'll move into the next item, which is uh, recommended actions. And we have a um, consent agenda tonight uh, that consists of uh, several sets of minutes, the school committee meeting, uh, meeting minutes of April 12th, 2012, the curriculum committee meeting of April 3rd, 2012, 
the superintendent evaluation committee meetings of March 29th, 2012 and April 11th, 2012, and the joint school committee city council meeting minutes for April 26, 2012. Uh, there's also a contract uh, uh, with actually a change of language amendment to the uh, previously approved Clark School contract, and uh, there are no field trip requests. Um, is uh, before we start, is there a motion to? Can you separate out the public schools? Sure. We, we didn't get the language change. All right. Okay. So, what that is okay. so what we will do then is, um, so I guess, would you like to just move to remove that from the consent agenda? Is that what we need to do? Sure. Can we ask uh, Mr. McLaughlin, uh, the Clark School lease uh, language change agreement, do we have copies of that? I have, I have copies to be signed tonight. I can read the changes in the language if you wish. Yeah, but they didn't get that in advance. They did not get that in advance. Okay, so you better pull it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Okay, so I move to pull that. Out. Okay. Second. So, um, all those in favor of removing that item from the consent agenda and moving it out into the rest of the regular meeting, um, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. So then we're back to the remainder of the cons. Move the re remainder of the consent agenda. Okay. As presented. So, the, so there's a motion made and seconded on the consent agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? All. Uh, Yes, there shouldn't be. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, great. The uh, next item are reports and recommendations. And the first is a report from uh, Daniel Dietz, our NHS student representative. Thank you. It's a busy time at the high school with AP tests going on this week. Also, MCAS is taking place next week. However, with this busy schedule, we have good news. The visit from NIAS went well, and they seem to enjoy visiting in our high school. Also, it's a great time to be a senior with fun events commemorating our high school experience coming up. We had a great award ceremony on Tuesday night. Also, the Key Club is having a making pillowcase event, which is gonna be for kids in foster care and for also kids who are ill. If you know how to sew, you're welcome to come at the high school Monday night at seven o'clock. Thank you. Uh, the next item is a presentation, and I wanted to recognize uh, Principal Nancy Athis for a presentation of the 2012 Teachers of the Year. Good evening. So, um, Sue Biggs is supposed to come, but I think that she had a game of practice, so she may see her come in very shortly. Um, Sue Crago is with me. I'm very pleased to announce to the school committee that, as you know, we're part of the MIMSI grant, the Math and Science Initiative, and this year two of our teachers were chosen as MIMSI Teachers of the Year. And what that means, on the weekend of May 23rd and 24th, they, were, um, will, they will be honored in Washington, D.C., um, and they will also receive a monetary amount for, for their teaching um, supplies or what they want to do in the classroom. It's really a huge honor. There's only 23 teachers who um, are part of the MIMSI grant that have been awarded this honor this year. So I know that on their agenda, part of it is going into the Congress, so maybe they can see the president or meet some of our congressmen. Um, if I could, I would like to read in a recommendation that I wrote for Sue Crago for this award, and then one that Amy Johnson, who was the MIMSI Teacher of the Year last year, wrote for Sue Biggs. Okay. As a principal of Northampton High School, I've had the opportunity and pleasure to work with Sue Crago for the past four years. She is articulate and knowledgeable, and in my opinion, an exemplary teacher. She is professional and is always seeking ways to do things better or more efficiently. When visiting her classroom, I'm always awed by her presentations and the depth and breadth of her knowledge of English. Sue has been in the educational field for 28 years and is certified in English. She has taught a wide range of students from advanced placement to students at risk in alternative settings. Because of these varied opportunities, she has developed a wide range of techniques which help students in her advanced placement classes. Currently, she is an advanced placement English and Humanities teacher at Northampton High School, responsible for over 100 students during the course of one school year. Last year, 80% of these students had qualifying scores on their advanced placement tests. She is acutely aware that students have different needs and learning styles. Sue is legally blind and always pushes her students to do their very best. 
Her motto is, if I can do it, you can do it. We might need a little help or do it in a different way, but it certainly does not stop us from achieving our very best. Classroom walkthroughs, observations are always varied. One could see students participating in Socratic seminars or discussing a pertinent topic. She always gives students choices for prompts and topics as one can always measure the same skills by using different ways to measure mas mastery. She is a teacher of excellence and I recommend her without reservation. Sue Kegel. And then Sue Biggs from Amy Johnson, and I just, it's kind of anecdotal, but I was telling Sue on the way in here that they both have 28 years of teaching experience. I don't know if that means anything, but I thought it was kind of <laughs> curious that the two of them had it. I am writing to highly recommend Sue Biggs for the Mimsy Teacher of the Year. As a past winner myself, I cannot think of someone more deserving of this award. Sue has a love of her subject and the respect for her students that are hallmarks of excellent teachers. She is not only extremely competent in her subject area, but she is also enthusiastic about deepening her knowledge in chemistry as well as in related fields. She and I often discuss ways to improve our teaching by collaborating and crossing over between physics and chemistry. And I can add in here that she asks me every year if she can have the same period as a prep period that Leslie Prudhomme has for AP Bio so she can learn about biology during her prep period. She continually analyzes her own practice in order to have her classes be the best that she can, they can be. She never stops learning and progressing. Although she has been teaching for 28 years, she has the enthusiasm of a first year teacher with the knowledge and experience that comes with 28 years in the classroom. She has an easygoing manner, her organization of topics, and her desire to have her students succeed make her a favor among students at Northampton High School. Her classes are always very successful, both honors and AP, and her students always feel challenged yet supported. She has a talent for teaching that is so much more than practice and tenure. And when she's not in the lab, she can be found on the lacrosse field or the soccer field. And we're very proud of her as well. Nancy, um, first of all, it's incredible. Congratulations to you, Sue. I'm glad that you're here tonight. It's nice to see you and to be able to acknowledge the great work that you do in the classroom every single day. I just want to mention that this is really exceptional, uh, that we have two Teachers of the Year from the same school, and you two very much deserve the acknowledgement and the reward that you're getting. So thank you for what you do. Uh, Nancy, I was wondering if, as long as we're on the topic of the MIMSI grant, uh, uh, the school committee had received a copy of the letter tonight that we had sent home to parents and I just wondered if you could speak to it for just a moment, just a brief explanation about how this funding uh, exchange occurred uh, and just give them a little more insight. Well, as part of, as part of the MIMSI grant, they give a reimbursement to the school um, every year based on the number of AP exams that are given. This year we're giving 789 exams. Um, students in our school not only take the exams that they're enrolled in in their courses, but for example, if you're in physics uh, B or C, you can take the physics, I think it's the E&M exam, and you don't have to have part, been part of that course. So that's the reason why we have so many kids um, taking AP exams. The other piece to it is, is that when MIMSI first came in four years ago, what the um, advanced placement coordinator did, uh, MIMSI gave money back only for English, math, and science exams, but we were able to reduce the fees of the foreign language exams that we had and also for um, the history exams. And this year, because of a federal... Okay, hold, hold one second. So because of the grant that MIMSI gave to the school, you were able to reduce the fees that students paid for the test for the past couple of years? For the past four. Okay. Okay, thank you. And so with that said, uh, they, they passed a new federal law that the students would in fact have to be in reimbursed and not the school. So we... W so we had already reduced the price of the exams based on the fact that we were going to get the reimbursement for the school. So the students paid a reduced price. And yet, instead of getting a reimbursement for the school, uh, the f change in the federal law led them to give the reimbursement back to the student who had already had the discount, correct? Okay. Okay. And so 
Um, there's hidden costs within the exam as well um, with proctoring and, and free and reduced lunch, to, et cetera. So with that, um, there would be quite a deficit in the testing account. So we are asking that the students sign over the, um, the checks. Right, so because they already had a reduction in their fees, they're getting the check back what used to go to the school. So this letter is to parents and to kids to explain the change and to ask them to give that reimbursement back to the school because we reduced their fees already. Correct. Okay. And I think it's important to note as well that students that are taking the environmental science or the extra physics exam, that has already been paid for by the school because we get reimbursed through MIMSI. Mm -hmm. So the full cost of that exam um, needs to be reimbursed back to the, the school because. Yeah, so in that case, it wasn't just a reduction. It was a free exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, I just wanted to say, as a parent of a child who's taking AP classes, I received this letter. Um, and although it's certainly well written, I'm afraid that a lot of parents aren't going to read all the way through it. And, uh, recommend this to, um, to their kids to, to take care of this. I'm wondering if before the AP exams, if the kids will be prompted about this as well, or if that could be done. Because I just hope that the word can get out more than just through this letter, because if the, how much money are we talking about that might not get reimbursed if we don't receive these checks back? It's, it's in the thousands. Yeah. We've had some parent phone calls and we've responded to them. We are going to talk to the students, but they're right in the, the heart of it now for the next probably week and a half. So as soon as they're done and they're back in class before the seniors leave, um, we will talk to the seniors. Do you know when the checks are actually going out? Um, the checks, I have the checks, and until we sent that letter out, um, it's uh, it's incumbent upon the school to do that. They um, So you have them addressed to the kids? Yeah, right. right. So you have the opportunity in some way when you give those out to the kids to ask, to, to explain to them what's going on and to have Correct. them sign them right over. Mm -hmm. and right. Do it in okay. I, was, I was concerned that they were going to arrive at home and oh, never see no. the hat. <laughs> no, that's a good question, though. Important. Yeah. Okay. okay. Meanwhile, Sue Biggs walked in, and we said a bunch of nice things about you a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> you missed it. So, uh, but you're here, so we can honor you with a round of applause, because we're very proud of you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Okay. You're next. So we're moving on to the next, <laughs> which is the uh, NEASC visit report from you, or comments. Well, I think that Dan did a nice job in talking about it, and he's absolutely correct. Um, in terms of our school, our school was really a hub of activity uh, for four days, but I really think it's the planning process that um, is an incredible process, and I think that my back, my two staff members would agree. Um, we actually were doing this self-study for two years. Um, thank you for our late starts, I have to tell you, because they, if without those, we really would have had a problem. Um, when the NEAS committee two weeks before, there's a lot of planning that goes on, there's schedules, and it all has to kind of fit in together. I, I guess I compared it to planning a wedding, seeing that I've done three, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite as much fun at the wedding at the, you know, when, when it all came through. But uh, they were very, very impressed. Uh, when they leave, they bring everybody into the auditorium and they talk mm -hmm. to, to us. And um, they were very impressed by the instruction that they saw going on in the classrooms. Uh, they said it was commendable. They loved our facility, Northampton High School, which is a beautiful facility. They talked about the turnout. They were very impressed by the people that turned out, both for the panel discussion, for our afternoon events, and finally for the reception. And um, <clears throat> there's going to be some issues that we have to, I won't say issues, but places that we need some work. And, and it will be in the core value area, We're rolling out the school-wide rubrics. It was all new to us. and. Um, so we will work on that. Um, they saw a definite need for teacher collaboration. They felt that in the long block they heard over and over again, there isn't enough time in the course of the school day. For example, a teacher said she would love to be able to team up with a history teacher and do a lesson together. So um, working in the uh, professional learning communities next year, as, as we plan to as an administrative team, that may um, you know, help our 
need to collaborate together and I have some things planned for fa uh, faculty meetings. They talked about the need for more common assessments and uh, the last thing they talked about was uh, vision district and, and school-wide. Uh, they didn't feel that we had long-range planning um, in place in some areas and, and I think that we won't be surprised when we read the report which probably won't be back for a few months for the initial look and then in six months you'll get the official report but I don't think you'll be surprised I think you'll be pleased in many of the areas um, because it was an all-out effort uh, by the whole school district and I can't thank everybody enough um, my staff my students administration to you for helping and the technology went off without a hitch. Thank you, Bill. And then all who contributed in to our own hotel, Northampton, that made their visit a flawless um, event, which is really critical um, in the planning process. So all in all, I think that it went over very, very, very well. Any questions? Well, thank you and congratulations to you for leading that process. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the uh, next item is the business manager's report. As part of the report, there was a number of uh, attachments, but I'd like to go through the narrative portion of it first. A couple noteworthy items. I'm sorry, you must not have this bed report. That's good. Um, uh, it yes. It is. It is before it's before me. Yes. Yeah. I apologize that I must have not had the one that you sent out yesterday. Okay. So, okay. So I guess I need to ask for the SPED report then. It's not on mine either. It's not on his either, <laughs> so I don't feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember putting it on. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> you have it? Thank goodness. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, great. I appreciate your time this evening. I had the opportunity to present a similar report a few weeks ago to the administrative team, and we just thought it would be very helpful if I had the opportunity to uh, share some of the similar numbers with you. I just wanted to give a, an update on some of our larger accounts. At this point in the year, the tutoring account, these are in no specific order, but our tutoring account, which was initially funded at $50,000, we have approximately $12,330 left uh, based on the encumbered. Sure. Thank uh, you. Based on the encumbered numbers, we are looking at about $12,000 for the rest of the year to finish out our tutoring. So it's anticipated we will be in the black. This is these are funds that go to home hospitalizations uh, if students have accidents or are uh, hospitalized, let's say, at Providence or the Brattleboro Retreat, these funds provide the uh, ongoing academic instruction. Our special education therapy account, which is funded at 150000 we are projected to be in the red by about 155000 These funds are used for assistive technology therapies such as assistive technology, <laughs> OT, PT, vision, we contract uh, significantly with HEC, services through the Clark, uh, T, uh, Terry Dooley Smith and Associates, uh, CTA, Community Therapy Associates, Futures, uh, provides services for um, Perkins School for the Blind is one of our largest contracts at 82,000. And again, these are therapies that are provided to students. We have been looking at these, uh, looking for areas that we could have some efficiencies. For instance, the Perkins contracts for the visions, uh, vision therapy, and also contracts for vision therapy with the collaborative. Uh, we've been considering, and we posted for a position for a vision therapist, but we haven't found, we haven't had the application with somebody who has the, the qualifications at this time, and we're continuing to look uh, similar to many other surrounding districts. And I have been in contact with those districts also to see if we might be able to share a position if somebody is identified that would be appropriate and is looking for full time. Uh, we're also looking at other areas such as the assistive technology and keeping track of the numbers. And again, it's an area where although we're beginning to approach the, the realm of advertising or considering hiring one of our hiring out and having our own person on staff, even though the, the sums are in the tens of thousands, it's still more cost effective at this time to uh, contract with the collaborative. Another account, uh, main account is our called Mainstream. We are looking at a projection of $83,000 in the red. 
Uh, this again is services that are contracted for or through CareerWorks, uh, community enterprises, uh, mainstream uh, services through the Clark, James Levine and Associates. Most of these services involve transition services for students who are going from 18 to 22. It includes the ICE program, the Inclusive Concurrent uh, Enrollment Program at uh, Holyoke Community College. As I said, the mainstream services through the Clark and James Levine and Associates uh, provides the districts with a lot of provides the district with a lot of autism spectrum disorder consultation in addition to uh, professional development with positive behavioral interventions and supports. Our evaluations at this time we are 47,719 yeah, 45,719 dollars in the red. I, again, I want to emphasize these numbers will change. They could go up, they could go down. It's based on the encumbered evaluations that we have contracted for, but these evalu evaluations don't always take place. Uh, these evaluations include I IEEs, which are independent educational evaluations that parents have requested, uh, bilingual evaluations, both speech and psychological, uh, vision evaluations, and assistive technology evaluations. I have noted here an assistive technology evaluation runs from $1,300 to $1,500. So just a, a general idea of if we're doing simply 10 of these evaluations, we're talking 15, upwards to $15,000 a year. And that's again one of the areas why I'm keeping a very close watch on at what point is it more cost effective to hire our own staff versus uh, continue to contract out. And clinical evaluations is another area we're looking at. The yeah, out-of-district, or the 9,000 account, was funded at approximately 2.8 million. We're not expected to exceed it this year. We're hoping to come in under, uh, just under, again, based on what we currently have encumbered. Again, this is a number that can change based on LEA assignments or other students coming back in the district or conversely going out of the district. So Nathan, if I could just interrupt you for a moment here. For us, it's hard to follow all of these numbers without something in front of us, but what you just mentioned is very important, so I would ask you to pause and mention it again. Okay. Uh, the 2.8 million, which is the most, the largest account that we have, the added district account, at this time, the projection based on what we have encumbered, what we are expecting to spend, should be on target. We do not expect to be in the red on any out of districts, but that number changes again based on students who may come back in the district before the end of the school year or if we were in a position of sending a student out of the district before the end of the school year. This year we appear to be on target not to exceed that. Uh, a projection again for next year is very hard to put in place, but I do feel that with the supports that we've put in place, with the investment in our in-district programs, with the number of students we've sent out versus the number of students who are graduating, I think we're beginning to turn the corner and we should hopefully begin to reduce this number as of, of next year. We, I would not feel confident saying by how much or until, to be honest with you, until probably October or November. At that point, we would then be able to say, this is where we ended 2012. These were the students, the total number that were coming in or coming out. Uh, it is, that would be again based on assumptions. We are looking at a, uh, transitioning a number of students back into the district over the summer. But we've also had other requests or hearings requesting out of district placements. So it is again one of those numbers that fluctuates. This year we were very fortunate not to have too many LEA assignments where um, another district is saying that a student moved in or a student moves in prior to the April 1st and therefore we're looking at being fiscally responsible for the following school year. So we've been very fortunate with that number and I think that will, will also assist us. But that number, the $2.8 million that we allocate for out-of-district placements, placements, sorry, that's sort of a standard allocation from year to year? It's about 10% of our total budget if we're looking at a $28 million budget. I frequently say that it's okay. one in 10. Those are the numbers I wanted to make sure we highlighted for the yes. school committee to understand. Yes. Yeah. It's one in $10 allocated mm -hmm. to the district. And this year, again, we funded the account at $2.8 million. The year before it was $2.8 million. I believe the year before that it may have been more around 2.6, and the year before that 2.3. I don't have the actual numbers. Okay, but that's the trend. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
but I'm, I've been working over the last two years to see that trend reverse itself. Other I, area districts have been able to reduce their added district spending by increasing supports for programs within the district, which right. again really is in the, the name of inclusion, providing for all right. students within the district. Right, and you've been working very hard and very admirable, admirably on turning that around, and uh, I appreciate that. I just wanted to highlight that point. Yes. Thanks. And uh, similarly, something that we I frequently bring up with the uh, administrative team with 2.8 million, if we could reduce that number simply by a third, that would be an additional $1 million coming into the district every year. And of course, some of that would have to continue to go to the investment within those programs, but it would be a, a significant reversal. Right. Uh, beyond that, just some of the highlights, as I've said before, some of the reasons why I feel that we are headed in the right directions for reversing this. Uh, we have continued to uh, offer PD, specifically around LD. We now have over 12, uh, 12 teachers who are certified Orton-Gillingham tra uh, trainers. Excuse me, 12 teachers who are certified Orton-Gillingham tutors, not trainers. And we've provided training in the Linda Mood Bell methodologies. The only other area that I, I account that we sometimes exceed is our special ed legal and this is something that's frequently brought up and unfortunately which is keeping Mr. McLaughlin up at night it's hard to actually have a number they have a tendency to be a little late in their billing and we have had two hearings so far this year uh, we recently were in federal district court for an appeal of a favorable decision for the district and we also had a favorable decision, I believe it was in January, may have been February. So we did go through uh, two hearings this year. And again, uh, we haven't finished the year at this time, so we are continuing to receive consultation. But it's another account that sometimes will exceed by a little bit. We weren't too far, uh, far off base as of February. But again, I don't have the bills for March and April at this point, so. What, what is the total number? We're coming in even with what was budgeted. What was budgeted? Budget for for that legal legal services. So I believe we're budgeted this year at sixty thousand, and I'm not saying we're going to come in at sixty thousand. We may exceed that. Yes. I just wanted to clarify. You said something about um, graduating students. Were you trying? To, um, we were talking about kids who are now aging out of Northampton Public School Services, and so and as kids come in, we're going to. Um, try to keep more of our kids in district rather than sending them out. So is that what, what you're trying to say? It is. And it's also one of these balances where we have to look at if where we're allocating our resources for program development. If I was to look, let's say, at the high school around learning disability students, we really don't have anybody at this time that we could bring back in for next year. Or we have two seniors. And the idea of trying to create or intensify a program we're not going to try to bring two seniors back in. It's their senior year. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be supported. It's not in their best interest when they've been out for an, uh, an extended period of time. So we are looking to uh, continue to provide assistance, specifically around the social, emotional, behavioral components. This again is um, probably equaling upwards to two thirds of the number of students that we have out of district. So we've been looking at increasing the licensed social workers, specifically at the elementary level and at the high school level. Last year, we reinvigorated the alternative learning program at the high school, and we've managed to uh, provide the appropriate services for a many number of students and hold on to students in that program, even though we've gone through the, the mediation process with a state facilitator, uh, the parents had agreed at that time that it was an appropriate program. So when we have the appropriate resources, you are, aren't sitting around a table and coming to the position of saying, well, I guess we really can't do that, or even having parents saying, I'm adamant the student has to go out of the district. This is the only place where uh, they will you know, receive benefit. So as kids are getting older, you start looking at kind of a cluster of needs that maybe that we can identify so that we can meet those needs? I'm not sure what you mean by as kids get older. I'm well, looking as at it as a whole, you know, an overview of, of everywhere and where's the most effective uh, way of addressing those resources. And in the past, we had a significant number of students who were out of uh, district because of learning disabilities. And over the last three years, 
we have increased our, our program by a point six teacher and again it's some of it goes back to not even addressing a program but it, addressing through RTI all students it's not just special ed and by addressing students who may struggle earlier on providing that instruction we've been able to reduce the referrals for special education I wish I could really say reduce the referrals I don't have hard numbers on that but we are seeing fewer students who are requiring uh, that level of assistance specifically around reading Thank you. well done are there any other questions for Mr. Ziegler Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we will uh, go with the business report. <laughs> We're off on that. Thank you. A uh, couple noteworthy items as part of the uh, business manager's report. The FY13 budget, as you know, was presented to the City Council on April 19th, and it was presented with the three options that we initially had discussed so they could see how we were thinking and how we were developing our budget process. We also had a joint meeting with the City Council uh, and I think there was an excellent exchange of ideas and sharing of information. I think uh, everybody walked away from the table with uh, um, uh, a good feeling. Um, renovations at Clark School um, will begin on June 25th. I, I will address the amendments to the Clark School contract at the end of the entire business report. Um, in your packet you have the financial statements. I've gone over most of the lines and have explained most of the lines uh, to you in the last uh, three or four meetings, but we are still um, looking at each of the lines. We are drilling down, uh, analyzing them. We are finding, uh, just like anything else, when you handle you know, 15,000 invoices and you're handling $23 million, there are some things that get charged to the wrong accounts and some things that need to be reallocated. So as we continue to drill down, we find some minor things like this and correct them. So it helps us when we file our end of the year report with the Department of Ed. Um, the budget, um, the superintendent did present the budget on the 19th. Uh, again, the uh, school committee and the city council had the joint meeting uh, on the 26th. Just kind of skipping. Well, I think to be clear, we presented talking points to the budget. We didn't present the budget. We'll be presenting the budget in the June meeting. Thank you. Yeah. That, that is correct. Talking points. Um, uh, let me skip down uh, into food service. We're still investigating the uh, software module, which will uh, uh, notify parents and tracking of the student balances so they can make payments and see what their child is eating, uh, eliminate the need for printing late payment notifications. So we're still moving forward with that. The food service department will be presenting to the budget and property committee uh, in the first meeting in June. So that's, that's coming up and you will get results of that after that presentation. Uh, transportation, um, we're still looking at all the associated costs uh, with uh, a late school opening. We're putting lots of hours into the research and uh, information gathering process to this. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of behind the scenes questioning and uh, looking at ideas and coming up with uh, optional thoughts to make sure that we are addressing all the different aspects so we make sure that um, as we go through this process we have a, a good solid understanding of what happens and uh, Im budget imp implications as we move forward. The uh, late school opening presentation will be made by the superintendent on May 16th and uh, another area in the budget in the transportation area is I'd like to congratulate Durham School Services. Now Durham is the company we contract with with our uh, 71 passenger buses. Um, they had competed in a particular competition recognition and they placed first in North America and, <coughs> were, and were recognized for their dedication in preventing street in work-related accidents. Now there was a number of statistical reports and things that they had to report, but when it all came through, um, they won that category of the 2011 Safety Challenge. So um, that really bodes well for the bus company that is transporting our students at the current mo at the current. So uh, 
you should feel, feel really proud of that. Um, insurance, um, um, I think I covered that and the mayor did in prior meetings, but I, I think the final number is now dropped below 8.25. Uh, and I'm not sure if there is a, a final number that's coming out, but I had 8.25 in my presentation. I think we might have scooched a little bit lower. 7.5 now. 7.5. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Good work. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that completes the narrative portion. You do have as an attachment, it just says contract, it says Clark School. In the description it says amend the quote, build out contract language as presented. And what we did was uh, review the language that was initially developed for Clark School. And in one of the sections, when we initially wrote the lease and the contract with them, uh, the change is uh, we're making changes to the lease space uh, and who would be re financially responsible for doing the renovations and the upgrades to the building. So the changes um, initially written will be carried out by school district personnel or by contracts that contractors that we hired. The school district will need to approve the changes involving construction and uh, that language was originally put into the contract because we did not know the capacity or the capabilities of what Clark School uh, could do with that space. And upon meeting with Clark School, it was determined that if Clark School is paying for those improvements and those renovations, that they would be permitted to um, put in as much money as they wanted. It would not take the time of our staff, our labor, or any of uh, our costs since their money is uh, modifying those rooms. But what we did was we shifted the burden so it would better, one, protect the district, two, save us time and money, and uh, three, become a little bit more efficient in the handling of that construction process. So if they had particular vendors that had done similar work for them at their prior campus, uh, they're very familiar with what would need, be, need to be done to renovate those uh, three classrooms. So as we looked at that, we talked about all the work that will be carried out by them will be approved technically by us to ensure that it meets all of our guidelines for building construction, but they take the onus of responsibility. They ensure that all their contractors hold the million dollar liability, the $500,000 of property damage. Um, it, it relieves us of that responsibility and our responsibility only becomes an oversight uh, responsibility. The same work was be, will be getting done as initially discussed and they're still going to stay onto the same timelines of June 25th, um, which would, they would commence the work and they would uh, complete the work by August 10th. The work is being completed by August 10th because we need a, a week internally for our staff to finish changing and relocating the final rooms at the lead school, but also clean up the area, make it presentable. The following week, most of the teachers are back into the building. They're moving their personal items in, getting their classrooms ready, and then we're right back into professional development, teacher orientation. So they have a very short window in which to do this. So the onus of responsibility is for them to take their vendors and contractors contractors and compress that into that June 25th to August uh, 10th time frame. So um, after um, on several meetings and reviewing that, that was in the best interest for the school, the city, and uh, getting this project completed. So that was how the change in the language came about. All right, so just to clarify, there were two important points that we checked with the Inspector General. Uh, this is a private school with private funds doing the remodeling in a public school building. It was unique and some questions came up that I was excited to get the answers to. Uh, one is that as, because of the way it's being funded by them, they don't have to follow the procurement, uh, same procurement process that process, we have to yes. follow. <coughs> uh, however, they do have to pay the, the wage laws. Correct. Right? So the, I forgot the term for it. Prevailing, the prevailing, prevailing wage. wage. Right, yeah. 
Uh, so those are two important points to make. And tonight. that's how they can <coughs> expedite this a little bit faster than we could uh, in that process upon the ruling by the Inspector General's office. So right. that's why working with Joe Cook uh, in procurement, we changed and modified this language. It doesn't change anything else in the contract, but just uh, the development, the speed, and where the responsibility lies in the materials and supplies to get those rooms renovated. Um, just to clarify, you said that any plan, any building design has to be um, approved by us first, is that correct? correct? Us meaning wh whom? Um, central services. Okay. So anything they do, before they do anything, it has to be approved and is all of this in, in um, concert with the, the principal? Yes. When, when I say approved, they would be coming in and presenting us with their formal plans. They have an architect that has been looking at the plans to do any of the, the, uh, the CAD CAM designs for what they need to modify in that room. But we still, because it's our building, we still have the over, um, oversight and the umbrella of what is going to happen in there so uh, we can guide that process. So we're signing off on a plan and then they have to meet those specifications that they're reliable for anything that helps. Correct, and if they do any other damage to our property in, in and while they're changing and modifying those spaces, they become responsible for any type of repairs. Do you, do you know roughly offhand what kinds of modifications they're making? Well, I was at the meeting last week where uh, the Clark School people uh, presented the plan and also the transition plan to the faculty at Leeds School. And they showed the CAD drawings on a PowerPoint. They're taking uh, the rooms and dividing them up and putting soundproofing in, changing the HVAC plan. Uh, so that obviously if you're taking one room and dividing in two, you want air and heat in both of those rooms. And they have some quiet testing centers too. It's actually a very beautiful plan. They're doing a high quality job of remodeling those rooms. So everything they're doing is internal. It's about recreating this. this I mean, nothing is going, oh, yes. building out or yes. anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also went to the Leeds meeting, not the same one that you went right. to, but when they presented. And I had um, some concerns about the rooms, the way that they are. and hidden costs for us um, with the new floor plan, plan which I have what was old and what was new I understand that they're going to spend hundred and fifty thousand dollars is what they what they presented what OJ presented to be spending to make the partitions and everything however right now as it currently stands in room 217 it's music and it's a soundproof room and it was soundproofed by us but in order to come um, accommodate the move from Clark Street is explained that music is now moving to room 210 and there is no it's and grade 5 is moving to 217 and we no longer will have a um, soundproof room ourselves for our music any longer yeah the uh, placement of classrooms and the placement of teachers within the school is the responsibility of the principal so Joseph uh, is, is making those assignments and I believe that he'll work with the music teacher to find adequate space for her to teach her classes actually they did that was part of yeah. his presentation mm -hmm. he did but we're going to lose a soundproof room in that process for our music that we already some, somewhere along the line had yeah. voted to put money into and for a reason and right now the DP is going right next door to the music um, and it's going to, I mean, we, we had already decided it as a school committee some time mm -hmm. ago to soundproof rooms for music, for distraction mm -hmm. and everything else. Now, in order to accommodate for Clark, we've shifted, I can say the principal, the principal has shifted everything around mm -hmm. and the principal has taken away our soundproof room for music and that to me seems like something that in order for us to accommodate them, we are losing and mm -hmm. that when they're building things out, the, that that should be considered whether I mean because they've essentially we've been displaced from our soundproof music room we had something and now it's not there anymore yeah, that's a good point and we should and we should have it I mean when we voted for it to be surplus and sh looking at this we've actually had to make quite a few accommodations of moving students of moving classrooms um, not ideally where they'd like to be according to the principal and the idea of the surplus rooms um, we didn't actually have them as much as we had to create them from according to the map that um, that was given and explained. 
Right, you voted uh, surplus space. Right, we split. And so what you had at Leeds is you have a certain number of people and a certain amount of space. Oh, I so the people spread out to fill the space. I understand, right. but we're losing out of this. We're losing out of this. We're losing because we're losing our soundproof music room, for one thing. You're Another right. thing we're losing is I was under the impression that um, we leased them out space. I wasn't under the impression, and now I know that somewhere along the lines, we are are going to be giving them half of a part of a public education for free. We're giving them our music, we're giving our music teachers, our phys ed teachers, our arts teachers, essentially our specials. And when it was asked what was you know what what we received in return, um, the only thing that they would were willing to give, well, two things was one diversity and two 10,000 books in the library that they no longer want to house or can house at Clark. But as far as any of their technology, any of their um, many reading specialists, literary specialists, or um, their vans for transportation, any of those things, they're not going to be sharing with us. Not even the teachers. I mean, the teachers will accompany them. They have a four to one teacher ratio. And I just think we should be charging them for that. Um, that might be a different thing, but I think we should be charging uh, private schools students for any accommodations that we had to make one being the soundproof room which is what I'm talking about right now and two um, probably another subject but I, I don't think we should be giving them our teachers without mm -hmm. financial compensation especially when we have such you know stringent budget restrictions right now that we're all trying to live under and trying to give away um, you know, to, to sell to the people that this is what's the best, and yet we're giving away some of our services to people who are making money off of it. I mean, it's a private education, and they, they're out of, we're not, we're not receiving anything that I see. Um, you're forgetting the amount of money we are receiving, right? For rent. For rent. No. no space rent. It's not for rent. The agreement is space and services. And the presentation was made here, and it was clear to the school committee that, that the students that the students would be integrated into our specials. That was part of the but we're agreement. we're not getting paid for it in any way. Yes, so we are. That's it. That's the lease. the lease. Yes, that's the okay, lease well, agreement. First of all, we're losing still a music room. Second of yes, all, yes, you're I think correct. We ended up taking a very bad hit on that. If that's what we did agree to, because our services are are very very valuable, worth a lot more than I mean. We we say our vision is student numbers and classes well in the specials classes if you have 20 kids in a class you're now going to have mm -hmm. 23 kids in the specials or if you have 23 you're going to have 26 mm -hmm. so our kids are suffering as a result of being able to be integrated because we're not getting anything really from that tangible no i feel suffering is too strong of a word i don't Did, right. stephanie would you in like in that agreement when they were going to specials that their teachers would be accompanying students in those Yes. Yeah, they accompany, yeah. but they don't teach. They don't no, anything. They just accompany, and they have a four-to-one ratio. They just make so much money that they should pay us for that, teaching their kids. We, that was part of the contract that we all agreed to, and that they were going to provide. So we now have a special with no teacher because our teachers bring the kids to their to the specials classroom and leave. But now there's going to be an extra adult to assist, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. are. It is part of our agreement, and there'll be an extra adult to assist. And I doubt they're going to just assist their couple of kids in the classroom. They'll be there. You know, would be my hope. So. Right. And they're going to do workshops in professional development, which are starting in the spring already for the teachers to learn how to work together when they're fully included in the specials. Okay. And the music room? You're correct. So Our music teacher, teacher will not have a soundproof music room. Any longer. So the other kids will be distracted. It's not the music teacher we're having a soundproof as much as the other students being distracted, which is what I heard that it was originally designed for. It wasn't so that the music teacher could be compensated as much as so that the other students who were being distracted could be compensated. Right. I wasn't at the presentation. I just was wondering, uh, are they going to use the soundproofing in that room? or? Just no, curious. they're going. No, that that room, which is uh, currently the music room, which is soundproof, is going to be one of the grade five rooms, and it's and. I was just curious it's whether put way over here, and there's a problem with that also because it's a brand new teacher, and they're going to be moving over here. So there's a lot of different things that we are just really. I think we're just really giving a lot. I was just curious Not whether much. the soundproofing was, if it was installed in the room, can it be installed and moved to? It? I'm assuming there are panels that have been installed on a wall. Can, they, can it be deinstalled? I think it's more complicated than okay. that. It's more yeah. complicated than that because um, they, um, the Clark School boasted of spending one hundred fifty thousand dollars on just that on soundproofing and then the cubicles, but and mostly on the soundproofing of how important it is okay. to be soundproof. So now, 
Any other comments or questions? Business manager's report. I think I there need that to be voted on. <coughs> this modification. Yes. Nice if it could be voted on this evening. Um. You, all you would be voting on would be the modification and the change and the shift of responsibility and how the work would be getting done. Instead of being done with our staff and our personnel, it would be done through contractors that Clark would negotiate with to have it completed um, in the same space, in the same area. We incurred a hot, you know, liabilities and everything else to protect us. Um, in, you're just voting on that change. Do you have language. those language changes highlighted? Is this something that's simple enough them it's to read and understand? It's just two paragraphs right here and then a signature. Okay. Right. Um, would, you, would you prefer to have that and study it and vote on it next meeting rather than this I mean, one? Did, does it delay things at all to, to wait for the next meeting to vote on this? Uh, I don't know if it if it delays anything uh, it might only from the point that uh, um, I know they want to start moving on it just like any, anything else um, I don't know if this has a delay whether there were particular questions I can uh, answer bring back or um, how about if I move that we take a short recess so that we can take a look at it so that we can take a vote on it tonight do you just have that one copy? It, yeah, no, I have five copies. Right, so we could it, circulate them. Could someone quickly? could could you read it out loud for us all to hear? Sure. I mean, I mean if we're going to have a discussion copies, about it, if you want five. One copy. If you, have if you five want copies. five copies, I can pass them around. You can look at I them, read them for them. yourself. Yep. Yeah, I I, I read right, better than I hear. Okay. <laughs> so there's a motion for recess. No, well, I'll, take I'll, that, I'll take that back. If we can just if, if we can share them while you're reading it out loud. Okay? Well, there's four. Okay, <laughs> there's four. Then I can pass around, then I, I can read five. one. <laughs> <laughs> Copies and <in. laughs> here. So actually, I'll, I'll, can I read it with the You certainly owner? can. You can read the alternate yeah, words. Okay, I'll give you a copy. Uh, there's just the two paragraphs. The first paragraph in section 9, delete, changes to leased space will be the financial responsibility of Clark. Changes will be carried out by school district personnel or by contractors hired by the school district. The school district will need to approve of changes involving construction. It is understood and accepted by the school district that Clark will divide classrooms 113 and 114 into smaller spaces. Now that is the original language that is in the current lease that is signed right now. That's been taken out and replaced with. And it's going to be replaced by and insert. Tenant improvements will be carried out by Clark. Clark will pay for all such improvements. Permits will be obtained by Clark prior to start of construction. Plans and specifications for proposed work shall be approved by Northampton Public School Superintendent and Central Services prior to construction. Such approval shall not be unreasonably withheld. All work shall be carried out in a workmanship-like manner consistent with the existing school construction. Workmanship to be responsibility responsibly judged reasonably. by what did I say Responsib reasonably reasonably yeah. Hang on, look at that reasonably judged by the Northampton Building Commissioner so it's getting reviewed as they go through this process all contractors entering the school shall be insured for one million dollar liability and five hundred thousand property damage all damage to school caused by tenant improvement construction activities will be the responsibility of Clark. Work will be carried out Monday to Friday during normal Northampton Public School business hours. If evening or weekend work is requested by Clark and agreed by Northampton Public Schools, in addition, and ad all additional Northampton Public School personnel costs will be paid by Clark. Work will start no earlier than June 25th, 2012, and must be completed by August 10th, 2012. So I will approval of this 
contract as read. Second. Okay. So the, the language uh, change has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or questions, Mr. Downey? Higher. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about the uh, business hours during the summer and what normal staffing was for that building because I don't know whether janitors are available there during the same hours they would be available during the year, whether they might be there in fewer hours, in which case we'd be staffing the building up in order to have it available for what might be the central office hours. The recurring additional cost. Yeah. The evening custodians that are on the evening would move to days. Everybody would be starting at seven o'clock, going till three or three thirty. So is that current practice though? I mean during during the summer? Right. That is correct. Okay, so there'll be no no change in current. The only time there might be a change if there isn't a previously scheduled evening activity, one of the daytime custodians would have been shifted to the night to cover an evening activity, and it would just be a change of shift, not an overtime type of thing. But in this case, everybody goes to the days. We get more done during the day when you move the night custodian uh, or the night custodians to the day shift, so you have three individuals on at the same time. Okay, but typically, during the summer, do you staff? You don't staff a night. Your custodians are there clean. They're cranking. Yeah, that's that's when they the summer work schedule. Yeah. Okay, but at night even? No. No, no it's only no. 7 to 3.30 usually. But I'm saying, but if you're moving one of those custodians. That only happens if there's an event like this? Right. Then a custodian is put on the night shift. Okay. Right. Even in the summer. So but I just I thought you said there would be the shift, but I was just not following how the shift would be happening if they were not, in fact. You said, you said there would be the night custodians shifted to the day. But during the summer, there would normally not be any night custodians. So. That is correct. Normally right. during the summer, there is no night custodians. They, no, she they, they, they go to work day shift during the day. So, which would be 7.30 to 3.30. Everybody would be working that shift. So, so the, during the day. Yeah, everybody's, the yeah, everybody's on daytime during the summer. So when contractors are coming in, they'd be coming in in daytime when the custodians are there. I just want to make sure that not an additional dollar, since, since we've already, no, it's not. they've already agreed to, to extend your right, payment mm -hmm. for weekends or for outside of business hours, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that no additional dollars will be spent. That is stated right in the last sentence. So if they had to stay. Right. No, I understand, I understand that part. I just want to make sure that there was no additional staffing. For instance, on, day, on days where we might not, you know, say, oh, there's no activities going on in the building, the custodians have done their work. But if the custodians are already there, then there's no additional mm -hmm. costs. Mr. Ball? Um, you stated um, if they had to stay, do they have a choice in whether or not they stay if Clark School says, well, we want to work nights and, um, you know, then we have to provide that with them if that's what they want? Clark School is going to do everything within their power so all of their contractors come during the day. If they get into the middle of a big project and they have four or five individuals on and they're trying to run some duck work and they need to stay for a couple extra hours, um, we will have one of our custodians also stay, but they will end up paying for that additional cost yeah, of our so custodians. Different. Will they have notice of the fact that, I mean, you know... Yeah, it says right here that if they do have to do evening or weekend work, they have to request that. Correct. Of, of me, I'll have to approve it, mm -hmm. and then we'll approve it, and if there's a cost, they'll have to pay the additional cost. Right. But the janitor who now is working the 40 hours a week over the summer, the custodian, mm -hmm. if Clark wants him to work five extra hours, does he have the right to say no, or are you going to go above him and say you have to because... I believe the custodians have to volunteer for overtime, and there's a system within uh, that department for volunteering for overtime. Okay. Yeah, Clark is just not going to go directly to the custodian and say, I need you today for five or six hours. Well, right, but get that I'm just wondering if our custodians still have a choice or if, if, if we say, well, they want to stay, so tough, you have to stay. Sure. Uh, There's an overtime system uh, yeah. that I mean, they have. Somebody yeah. will want, end up wanting and to And usually overtime. people kind of fight for overtime, so <laughs> there, there will be somebody who would try to grab that shift. You'll take it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or concerns? Okay, so then there's been a motion made and seconded to approve this contract amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Okay, the uh, motion carries. So you'll be, 
you probably want these back so they can all uh, yes and I'll sign at the end around yeah. at the end okay. for everybody to sign thanks sure okay that completes the business managers report so if you'd like to transition oh, right into the personnel question over here oh I'm sorry <clears throat> um, I just had a question about uh, school choice account circuit breaker account I know that we're getting farther along in the budget process and the school choice account and the circuit breaker accounts are places where any unexpended funds are accumulated at the end and they can they can or cannot be drawn on uh, depending on our decision for expenditures under the budget and I'm just wondering whether you have a sense of where the school choice account might end up uh, at the end of this fiscal year I know I think it was around hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars which was a very low amount historically and I'm just trying to get a sense of that uh, as well as the circuit breaker account because I know that's very important to uh, the district in terms of being comfortable that there's enough there if we had out of district placements that drew upon the easiest one to answer off from your question is the circuit breaker. We did budget $512,000 for this year uh, for funds to be used out of circuit breaker. We will use all 512000 of those dollars and uh, we will have various tuitions that circuit breaker will be covering for us because that's the nature of what circuit breaker is is designed to do so we will we will maximize all the funds in circuit breaker in school choice and uh, I don't have the actual sheet in, in front of me but we had a number of positions that the committee had voted to fund directly out of school choice and we had other items like electricity we had gas we had the uh, new uh, I believe it was the fifth grade teacher that was voted uh, back in the summer uh, we added to come out of school choice. Um, we will, we budgeted to use approximately $1.6 million out of school choice. We will use all $1.6 million. Um, we will have some monies left over in choice. I don't have the final number in front of me, unfortunately, but I can get that to you. Um, but we will have some monies left over as we move forward uh, into the FY13 year. Um, we're going to look like we're pretty much on target with the expenditures coming out of school choice. So what we budgeted for um, and including that 50, what we budgeted for was a $50,000 position because we didn't have a particular person hired for that fifth grade class. But we're pretty much, uh, give or take uh, $10,000 one way or the other of that $1.6 million. It looks like we're going to be right on target. I have a similar question. Just um, Most of our, these accounts on this financial statement, the year to date, um, are running pretty much where you know we expect at this point in the year, you know, sort of at the 70 or 80 percent mm -hmm. spent. Um, can you tell me? I'm just as curious why the tuition out collaborative is so low compared to what we budgeted. Is that just because of the way we pay, or is there? A, I mean, we budgeted at this. It's looking like we budgeted 100,000 too much if we continue at the. You know. <laughs> We, we didn't. We will, we will use up all of those monies. Okay. It's just it's, some of the items that are in here that are not at either 77% or 82% yes. expensed, some of them are due to timing. Huh. Some of them are due to the billings in which uh, the cycles of right. which some of the vendors do bill us and uh, also the change in some of our students going to the collaborative or going to any of the other out placements, out, out of district placements. So some of those fluctuate a little bit, but um, so most of it is due to, to timing and um, the number of students that move during the year. I was just struck by the fact that we spent less than half of the tuition out on collaborative. And, and, and these are some so of the far. ones that we're trying to chase to. Like a couple of months left. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's what struck me. <laughs> There'll be quite a bit that we spent out of there. It depends. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, just a question, because they're really small accounts, but I'm really curious about them. The ones we have overspent, what we budgeted, what are they? What is other instructional and what is attendance? The, the, uh, the attendance um, in that particular line, that's where you have your uh, 
uh, your social worker that goes out and visits visits the parents and uh, to ensure that the uh, students are uh, correctly uh, advised and, and that we have um, I don't want to use the person. So that's our attendance officer our that attendance works for officer. both us and you. Smith Vogue. Right. Thank you. And we split the cost with Smith Smith Vocational. And the reason that you see it here as being overexpensed is we have not made that adjusting entry with Smith Vocational. Oh, so we're paying for it all right now, but Correct. we will get a reimbursement. They reimburse us. They will be reimbursing us through a journal entry, and that number will change the next time you see the financial. What is other instructional? Uh, let's see, other instructional, where are we here? It's a really small account, it's only $30,000, but. <laughs> Um, line uh, I, I can't tell you what's exactly in that account. It could be it is, could be a number of things for thirty thousand dollars. I, I I'm just curious. Can't we, answer that. We can. Else has done such a good job. <laughs> these two things. We're over. So I have a good answer for one, but I don't know. We can look up the details on that and get I, it out I, to I you. Can, I can get you an answer. I don't. I don't need one right away. Right? I was just curious about it because I like. Otherwise, we're really pretty much really on track. Yeah. Which is very good to see, and I was just curious why those two have to be off. So I'm glad to hear one of them has a good reason, and the other one we don't know. The other one we'll get for you. Thank you, and I'll get you an answer to that. And they're small accounts, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions regarding the business manager's report? Okay, uh, do you want to transition to the personnel report? Certainly. Also, as one of the attachments that went out in the emails that were sent to you is the one page personnel report. And as you can see, uh, broken out into the same categories you've seen before, new hires, separations, retirements, promotions and transfers. Um, as you know, we're getting to the end of the year, so there's less change in these sheets, so there's less people that are going to be on the sheets. Um, and it's, it's uh, getting smaller. Hopefully the one that comes out in May will have less fluctuations. Okay. So, uh We'll now move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you. I'll share with you the highlights from around the district. Uh, Ryan Road Elementary School, the students have been actively incorporating outdoor field study exploration into many subject areas. Students have been visiting the nearby Vernal Pool to gather and observe pond creatures, including wood frog tadpoles, which are being raised in the fourth grade classroom. Fifth grade students have investigated adaptation through a number of different organisms, including the ones they've invented themselves. Second grade classes are collecting and dissecting soil, and these field studies have been motivating students in their reading, their writing, and artwork, as well as science. It leads the science collaboration between Smith College and leads uh, will continue in the second round of hands-on experiments. Chemistry students from Smith College will expand the scientific knowledge of students in the primary grades. Uh, the kindergartners will be taking a field trip to Smith Vocational School on May 9th and the purpose of that trip is for to students to experience a hands-on approach to zoology as they visit the animals. First graders are in the process of constructing habitats in their classrooms, which are part of their science unit on organisms. And the second graders are working with Hitchcock Center science guru Ted Watt on their outdoor science projects. These young scientists are studying pond habits in the Mill River as well as the vernal pools on the Leeds bike path. And the fourth graders will soon travel to the Boston Science Museum. In English at Leeds, the teachers are in the process of completing another cycle of professional development with literacy specialist Jenny Bender. The third graders attended the second half of the See, Hear, Feel film, film workshop at Amherst Cinema. The students watched documentaries and worked in teams to write and then perform sequels to the films. The collaborations developed an understanding of the tools that filmmakers use to move their ideas from imagination to the page. In music at Leeds, the second graders are writing original, melodic, and rhythmic patterns in a project called Our Sound Garden, and they will be playing them on xylophones. The fifth graders are busy rehearsing for their musical, The American Revolution. They'll be acting and singing their way through history. In art at Leeds, uh, it's being integrated into the science units with the Hitchcock Center grant and Ted Watt. Within the art room and in conjunction with Mr. Ted Watt, all classes will be creating art related to the science units that they're doing out in the field, such as drawings of pond life and a mural depicting the changes of the Mill River with the seasons. 
At JFK, Literacy Across the Curriculum Committee has been meeting monthly since the beginning of the year to develop a program that will address the new literacy standards. The committee is comprised of faculty members committed to supporting the literacy. They are Diana Ajon, Will Bangs, John Henry, Michelle Emanation, Michelle Eastman, and Mike Susi. Also at JFK, they just completed the Right Flight program. This was a collaboration between JFK Middle School and Northampton Airport and the Western Massachusetts Right Flight Organization. This program came to a grand conclusion on Wednesday, April 25th and May 2nd when 18 of our 8th graders took to the skies to fly a plane all on their own. And we were lucky enough to be here for an ALT meeting and they announced it on the loudspeaker and we all went outside and watched the kids fly over the school. <laughs> This was made possible with a grant from the NEF, the Northampton Education Foundation, and it was led by Sal Kanata, who wrote the grant and then led the program. The students enrolled in this program and then met the rigors of a 10-week course focused on aviation, history, science, math, and engineering. On their flights, they flew over Northampton. They were obviously flew over the Connecticut River, the Quabbin Reservoir, UMass Amherst, and uh, JFK, as well as some of their own homes. Upon conclusion of the flight, the students were able to enjoy lunch with the pilots, receive certificates of completion, their own flight books, and wings they can wear proudly on their clothing. Student Miriam Gora captured the feelings of all 18 students when she got out of the plane and simply said, that was the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> At Jackson School, uh, the fertile ground with the Jackson Street School Garden committees invite you to attend a school food forum. They should write easier sentences for me to read. <laughs> All right, the school food forum will offer uh, healthy eating uh, for healthy communities on Thursday, May 31st from 3.30 to 6 p.m. Workshops are free and they're designed for elementary school teachers and elementary school parents. There will be healthy snacks, PDPs offered for the teachers, child care offered for the families, and Spanish interpretation. For more registration information, please contact Maggie Shar. Jackson Street's mindfulness practices were featured in an article recently in, in the Gazette with photographs uh, from reporter Barbara Solo and photographer Kevin Gooding. The report included the school's NEF-sponsored mindfulness practice course that 30 staff have taken and our weekly Monday meditation as well as our monthly movement meditation. Over at NHS, I won't repeat the things you heard from our student and from Nancy Athis, but I wanted to mention uh, three other items. Seniors Savannah Holden and Emma Martin are the co-leaders and the new founders of the Rotary Interact Club. Uh, this is a club that's about community service on an international level, as well as a local level, and internationally these students are fundraising for school in Africa. They've created pen pal relationships with the club members and uh, also the with the club members, uh, Rotary Club members in Africa, as well as the students. And they've initiated fundraising to support a new water filtration system to help bring clean water to the African school. Locally, members of the club are teaching fourth grade students at Leeds Elementary School the basis of, of fundraising and community service. And the NHS advisor is Scott Mahar. And I was able to attend the Rotary luncheon where these students were honored. The Rotary was very proud that these students had the initiative and the fortitude to found a program, carry it out, put it into action, and now as these seniors graduate, they have juniors, sophomores, and freshmen who have joined the club and will carry it on in the future. Also, I wanted to highlight that Joel Bewert, a senior at NHS, has won two consecutive Western Mass Diving Championships. He also was recently in the Hampshire Gazette as the Swimming and Diving Player of the Year. He placed second in the Division II state championships this year, and he will be attending Auburn University in Alabama. Finally, on Tuesday, I was able to attend the Dollars for Scholars ceremony, uh, where local donors honored 137 of our graduating seniors with cash awards to help support their post-secondary school tuition. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report. Um, the next item is an update on the district improvement plan from the superintendent. So as you all know, we began this work in January with a retreat between the school committee and our administrative leadership team. 
Uh, we created a draft together, and this has since been edited and drafted as we move along in our uh, ALT meetings. And we also did a SMART goals workshop uh, where we spent two hours working on developing these goals. And it's coming back to you tonight. Uh, however, as we put the school committee packets together on Friday, we don't stop working until Thursday. So yesterday our ALT uh, team met, and again we spent a considerable amount of time doing some fine tuning and some uh, changes to some of the language in the plan, uh, which obviously not able to get the edits that fast to you. But tonight I wanted you to take a look at this. Um, well, hopefully you've already taken a look at this. And I wanted to open it up to you for thoughts, suggestions, comments, and questions. Again, this will, the f what I will consider the final draft will come to you in June uh, for your approval. Are there you were raising your okay. the, the comment I would make is that, boy, this sure looks ambitious. <laughs> that, and the, it's, it really looks like you've been having some very um, um, clear and comprehensive discussions. It was really clear in how specific the goals are and, um, and um, what we're looking to do. And it's very, it's very impressive what they're looking to get done in the next year. Thank you. We're pretty excited about it. Okay. Now, it, uh, you know, a lot of what we're going to work toward is, of course, budget dependent, but we're hopeful that uh, we'll be able to make these things work and we'll be able to move forward them within our current budget. Are there uh, questions or comments about the draft? It's, it's, a, it's a mirror, an extension, another part of that. The ambition is, I think it's uh, really good that um, the level of specificity as we move downward in the document from the beginning to the end, because I think um, previous sorts of plans that I've seen like this sort of tailed off towards the end. Mm -hmm. And this plan looks like it actually builds towards much more specific and again, ambitious goals. So I guess right. I don't know about more specific, but certainly as significant. And, and if we, when we have that original list and then we, the top numbers were chosen. So there's a whole list more of things that were considered still important, but less or so. So all of these are are significant. Some of them are easier to achieve than others. Mr. Meyer. Um, I think the district improvement plan draft looks excellent. The only, the only um, comment I have is in terms of that vision statement, which I'm already <laughs> And I'm always, open to changing I'm that vision statement. <laughs> by comments and vision statements, because in general, I, I like where the vision statement leads you. And that's mm -hmm. why the goal, the specific goals, which are really going to be evaluated by the Mm -hmm. team and by everyone who's connected with the North Hampton Public Schools. It's just when I read through the vision statement, it didn't have writerly punch, I would say. And no, again, it doesn't. And, and that's, <laughs> I understand that when you write by committee and with input and you're trying to take into account all the different mm -hmm. um, ideas that are on the table, it's very, very difficult. But that was, um, but just looking at it, I would, I would like that vision statement to stand on its own mm -hmm. and, um, so that when someone sees it, um, you know, we could put it up over a door. <laughs> Perhaps we wrote it in Latin. I, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that would, that I think that's why so many times people just, you just steal the vision statement from, the, from someone else or from some mm -hmm. old, you know, other writer, repurpose it, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's also not a complete Our mission is great and our theory of action is yeah, fantastic. The theory of action, our, our, our Definitely going someplace, and I just I just felt like that one could could be polished further. Mr. Alderman. Yeah. yeah, I agree that I mean the uh, vision feels like it was um, kind of the sum of a bunch of different ideas more than the than the others, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure about uh, what to embrace our evolving potential means. Is that talking about the students or? About the, the teachers and the learners, uh, all of our evolving potential <laughs> to succeed with integrity in challenging learning situations. <laughs> we footnoted each one of the words. <laughs> uh, you remember I tossed out to you, I believe it was a month ago or two months ago, that I'm open to suggestions. I received zero. <laughs> I didn't want to like wordsmith. <laughs> That's what we're doing now. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps we could have the English teacher of the year to look at. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> she should. <laughs> As a daunting assignment. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? 
Ms. I guess my question to you would be, was there anything else that came out of the alt meeting that would kind of help us <coughs> decipher what they were trying to do with the vision? No. I mean, <laughs> you know, we created that by committee and it okay. sure looks like it. Okay. Um, I just can't think of anything better. I think it's good. It's not great. And uh, I, I would love to have some input, have somebody uh, take a shot at rewriting it. I would love that, and I welcome it. Can I just ask, is, did it, and I should, maybe I should know this, but the vision should almost come out of the other stuff. So I don't know if it went from a top-down or from a bottom-up approach. Mm. When, when, it be, when, when, this particular when we did it, we did the vision first, yeah. right? Maybe going mm. out it might be more fruitful. I don't, I don't know. But I would, I, I have two quibbles, because if you put a statement in front of me, and I got a pen in my hand, I got a um, <laughs> I would say that the phrase evolving potential is actually redundant. Either you have potential or you don't. I don't think the potential actually evolves. Also, I think that I think it we does. Say, <laughs> with integrity and challenging learning situations, we're asking people to challenge their learning situations, not to succeed in what others might perceive to be a challenging learning situation. So, like, for example, in a room where the band is playing next door. <laughs> the <laughs> challenging learning <laughs> <school. laughs> I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> um, I would recommend that perhaps the chair, the co-chair, appoint a subcommittee to write a vision statement, and it sounds like we have some volunteers. <laughs> I think a committee of one. <laughs> I do thank the old team with the leadership for, for doing this work. I think that, that the plan itself is, is very admirable and impressive. Thank you. I, I really like the way that it's measurable with dates and uh, percentages. I think it really uh, is helpful when you go back and you look at um, where we were and where we are now. It, it's, it's measurable. I think it's really important um, when, when you're looking at these objectives. I would ask, Superintendent, um, who will, who and how will we um, follow up in terms of if we're meeting our deadlines, and how will that get reported out to school committee? Um, that's a good question. It will be up to you if you want us to bring this every other month or every month or once per semester to give you an update on how we're achieving our objectives. I think that would be very reasonable. Um, well, that looks like the first goals are for, for the start of the school year, so maybe um, an update at, at um, the end of the summer. Sure. Does that sound reasonable? Yes, I guess that was good. Just to kind of review this and kind of a talking point about where we are? For August mm -hmm. or September. Yeah, well, we are having our joint retreat again August uh, 2nd, I believe. Um, so that will be time we can maybe establish some dates for reporting out. Thank you. Mr. Ball, you had a question? Well, I just wanted to um, agree. Um, with the beginning line of evolving potential, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think it's more to identify and embrace our potential because, it, I mean, it's either potential or kinetic. <laughs> I, I, so you I know, think we I identify don't and embrace our potential instead of evolving our potential. <laughs> Your ego is not attached to this vision statement. We, we created it together. Yeah, our heart is our kinetic <laughs> focus, yeah. Our <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me promise you this. When I bring this back to you in June, you'll have a different vision statement. A full state, a full sentence? You may not have one that you love, because that's hard to do, but you will have a different one. Does it have to be one sentence? <laughs> it might be a word if you guys keep it up. Just perhaps a um, It's obviously easy for us to sit here and take pot shots of this mission statement, um, or the vision, but um, would it actually be helpful if we, anybody who wanted to, submitted a that was asked, that was asked for a couple months. I've, uh, I've been asking for that. I would love it. But I mean, honestly, yeah. if anybody here has a, a, a redraft of it, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of hesitant to form a committee and try to, because I think we'll just end up with like, <laughs> We've done that. A uh, worse version that mm -hmm. will be kind of cobbled together by everybody's ideas. So maybe we could have uh, some fresh versions of it that we could look at. And, a little writer's workshop. Yeah. <laughs> and since I, I welcome that. First, I'd, be, I'd be happy to, I mean, I, 
it's very, very difficult to do this, and I'd be happy to send something in. Once, a, once upon a time, I drafted the first draft of a brochure that was to try to attract hey, look how that dynamic out. and excellent superintendent <laughs> to Northampton. So, it worked. <laughs> You're good. Small part of that. <laughs> That'd be great. I think very appropriate for school committee members to uh, submit a vision. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, so that, uh, that's the update on the district improvement plan. Next will be an update on school choice enrollment. I believe you have a sheet in your packet, and I think it's very important, possibly even required by law, that I read this out loud. So uh, sorry for reading something you have in your hand, but I need to do that. The school choice lottery took place on May 1st in the superintendent's office. 63 school choice seats have been opened district-wide. Letters announcing the lottery results will be mailed to each applicant stating if they have received a seat or have been placed on a waiting list. Of those 63 openings, there are some grades that have been waitlisted and some that still have spaces available. Remaining openings may be filled in August. As per school committee policy, the uh, second lottery may be held in mid-August to announce any additional school choice seats which may become available. So the lottery results uh, for next school year I have to read each grade in kindergarten there were five seats made uh, that were opened up all seats were filled and a wait list was established in grade one there were nine seats three spaces are still available at Leeds and Ryan Road only in grade two there were six seats all seats filled and a wait list is established grade three there were five seats all seats are filled and a wait list is established in grade four, there were eight seats. There are two spaces still available at Leeds and Ryan Road only. In grade five, there were zero seats opened and a wait list has been established. In grade six, there were five seats. All seats are filled with a wait list established. Grade seven, there were three seats. All seats are filled with a wait list established. Grade eight, there were three seats. All seats are filled and a wait list established. In grade nine, there were 10 seats opened. All seats were filled and a wait list established. In grade 10, there were two seats opened. All seats are filled with a wait list established. Grade 11, there were four seats. All seats are filled and a wait list established. And in grade 12, there were three seats. All seats are filled and a wait list established. So you can see that we opened 63 spaces in our schools. We have filled nearly all of them and we are still taking applications. What happens now is that people will decide if they want to accept those seats, and then as people uh, accept them or decide not to accept them, then we go down the wait list. And occasionally it can happen that right now in some areas where the seats are filled and a wait list, you can actually go through the entire wait list and in August actually have openings, which is why we would have a second lottery in August, because it would be my goal to fill all 63 school choice seats. Wouldn't your family be to respond by if they're accepting the seat? I believe it's a relatively short uh, window of time. I believe it's a week, but it might be two weeks. Yeah. Annie, do you know, uh, or Mark, do you know any different? I can't hear you because of the... Oh, the question was, how long do the parents have? Once they're notified your child's been accepted to the seat, how long do they have to accept or reject that? And I believe it's a, it's very short time. It's, it's a, a week very short two. time. Right. Very short. Right. Yeah, people respond quickly, actually. We've been getting letters back this week a lot. Yeah. My other question is, um, are, are any of these wait lists very long? Like, what, how, how big are some of those wait lists? I believe, um, what the biggest one might be. from my memory from the lottery, which is held in my office, I believe that the longest wait list was seven. And uh, there were some that were only one or two people on a waiting list. So it's very likely that somebody will not take the seat that's been offered to them and we will fill that wait list. Or be able to empty the wait list. Mr. Bourne, yeah. how did you decide how many seats to uh, make available? Well, the principals have the first input, and they tell us what they think would be reasonable for their class sizes, their class sizes right now. So, for example, if there's a class that has 17 kids in it, they may say we can take up to three more to make it 20. Um, what we don't do is if there's you know, 19 kids in the class, we don't say, why don't we take a couple more and bring that class up? Because we try to protect the integrity of the classroom for our Northampton families, so that if they have a very comfortable class size, we don't try to fill it up with school choice seats. 
So the principals uh, f give us their best uh, estimates first, and then I get to make the final decision. Mr. Moore? Mm -hmm. I think that's my next question, which is related to this, the grade five zero seats with a wait list. I'm mm -hmm. assuming that's because that estimate of how many seats you will make available could change. Right. That otherwise, these people are waiting for nothing. Unless there's a possibility that, that you could create a seat. In You're correct. You're so correct. We'll say no. Also. And so by August or something, if, if the estimates change. Yeah. And you have uh, your enrollment numbers, so. Um, for example, if you look at Jackson Street and the current uh, class sizes in grade four, 18, and 18, uh, that's something that those obviously will be at grade five next year. So there is a possibility we'll open some seats there, but we want to watch that for a little bit longer. Be right, okay, because so of the changes so in their they're enrollment. Waiting, they're not waiting for somebody to reject a seat, they're waiting for a p potential seat to be created. Right, so if we decide to open more seats, they would be invited in. Is there any uh, discussion about this? Do, uh, do you want to require a motion of some kind to to accept the results of this lottery? Or I, I, you said that you were I don't required by the Right, I was required read to read this because okay. we're okay. we have to hold the lottery and okay. we have witnesses to the lottery. Excellent. And so I had to read what our results were. Okay. But you don't need to vote on this. I, okay. I do have one further follow-up question. A number of years ago, um, it, it was um, realized that the number of school choice seats made available on the elementary schools really had to be in concert with the principal at the middle school because mm -hmm. you couldn't be feeding kids in from four different schools into one without mm -hmm. a sense of how that was going to play out in the teams. Is that being done? Right, still? and that is considered, and that's part of the reason why um, we draw the line on fifth grade because there is some understanding in the community that we limit in sixth grade at JFK, so we'll try to get in in fifth grade and then you'll get promoted up automatically. And so we're very careful about the seats we open in fifth grade because of that very idea. I just wanted to, to add that as part of the information is that um, before fifth grade, I mean, people were trying to get a sense of not how big the third grade was at one particular elementary school, but how big the third grade is across the district because all those kids have to feed into JFK. Right. Yeah. And we have just a large number of requests for kindergarten. People obviously want to start with us and stay with us through the whole system. Uh, but the requests are so great that, I mean, we could really build another class. That wouldn't be financially advantageous for us to do that. Uh, but there are a lot of requests to come to us in kindergarten. And just to state for new members, in case you don't know this, once we accept a child into school choice, they're ours for 13 years if they want to be here. If they want to be. Get to second grade mm -hmm. and say, mm, we made a mistake, there are too many, we're going to not keep you anymore. We can't do that by law. Any other questions about the school choice enrollment? Okay. The next item then is an update on the budget development. Again, Mr. Salzer. All right. So uh, we have <coughs> our final decision on the money that we have uh, for next year. And therefore, what we're going to hand out here are the cuts that are results of our budget for next year. And our next step is to create the line item detail uh, budget book that you'll be getting in June, and it will reflect these changes. It's different every day. Yeah, it was like. different from morning to afternoon today, actually. <laughs> Is there another one, Mark? Or? Do you have another one, or is that it? Oh, I have one. Oh, can I have one more? Oh, wait. Oh, I have two. got it. <laughs> Thanks. So let me just talk you through this, um, the cover sheet. Uh, so the collective bargaining agreement is what we uh, yet need to fund. Uh, we need, due to enrollment, to increase uh, one full-time teacher at Leeds in the fifth grade. Uh, we've explained the increase in maintenance landfill costs. Uh, it's my recommendation that we put in our budget a $10,000 athletic financial offset um, because we often have to cover uh, the deficit. That's our yearly trend. Uh, also with food service, year to year we have to offset the cost, so we should put that in the budget and uh, make it legitimate. 
uh, as Nathan mentioned, uh, when we increase positions, like uh, I have here a full-time licensed social worker for the alternative learning program, we need to build, strengthen those programs to keep students in our system and to provide the services that they require. Uh, our Ed Jobs grant is being cut, and so we want to keep the services that we had the grant paying for 1.6 FTEs in occupational therapy. We have to move that into our budget. There is an estimated reduction in our district-wide grants and revolving accounts of $30,000, and very recently, an increase in 9 percent water and sewer that we will that will increase our expenses there. Which means that for next year, uh, our budget increases are $552,000. In order for us to provide a balanced budget, we have factored in the savings from the retirements that we will have, which is uh, merely $1,845. We will, will be uh, ending the positions of our three literacy intervention coaches. That's two at the four elementaries and one at the middle school for $145,000. We'll be decreasing our technology equipment budget and also not replacing one of the staff members. I uh, will say a critical staff member that those duties will be absorbed within the uh, current staffing structure for $75,000 savings. We will not be offering schools materials and supplies budgets to the schools. This is all six of our schools and uh, that comes to a mere $30,000. And then in order to get the additional $308,000 we had to lay off, reduce, uh, change positions, the equivalent of 7.0 full-time positions and how we are get to $308,000 is on the second sheet. So this sheet merely explains that one line item. You see the high school reductions, total of $64,000, the middle school reductions, total of $103,000, and the elementary school reductions of $141,000. Not all of these reductions in positions are cuts the entire job, though some of them are. Uh, some of them are a reduction in contract. Was people will lose up to 50% of their salary and benefits, uh, some 40%, some 20%. And that is what we need to do uh, to present a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. That's a question. So I'm comparing just the changes from the last, the last mm -hmm. week. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I noticed that one of them is an increase in the number of um, ESPs at the elementary level that were mm -hmm. used. And I know I've said this before, but I get concerned when we reduce ESPs because come summertime when we find out who our special needs students are, that's usually the first thing that we're, we're being asked to increase. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're correct. And so what we're going to have to do uh, as a new practice in our school system is that in the event that a student comes in that requires uh, extra support person, uh, we're going to have to cut something to provide that for them because it will be required by law to provide that for the student. So things will be cut or not replaced through attrition as the school year goes on if ESPs need to be increased. So are ESPs cut right now to the, to the minimum of what we know we need or is there some leeway in there? It's to the bare bones of what we need. So let me have, have you started thinking about what's what we might have to cut as soon as we find out we have other students coming in who will need more aid? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is that uh, throughout the year, uh, people leave their positions. Some people retire, some people quit, move on to other jobs, and what we will have to do is not replace certain positions. Um, we'll have to do that because we can't just cut somebody's job. So we will have to maintain a balance in our budget uh, by doing that. It's very tricky. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Um, the recommended budget decreases with the five FTE retirements of 1845 mm -hmm. um, I don't understand how it's so low because it seems to me if we're retiring them, we're retiring the upper end 
of the teachers. So if we replace them, even if we would replace them, mm -hmm. we would be hiring them in at a much lower salary. Mm -hmm. And so to go to the second page, mm -hmm. the middle school reduction, which is mm -hmm. what Ms. James was talking about today, of 1.0 of the world language. That's at 60,000. So I'm thinking, OK, there's a teacher. Could you explain? To me, please, why it's um, five was only a savings of a reduction of only 1,845. Yes, uh, not everybody who retires retires at the top of the scale. All right, some people didn't uh, don't earn higher degrees and don't move over that way. So replacing them is not that great of a savings to begin with. Uh, some of the people will ret will retire after starting the year. So, for example, um, Joint Principal McKenna. She'll be leaving in October. So it's not an entire year savings in the salary. Um, in addition to that, when people retire, they retire with some benefits. So uh, maybe a sick day, a buyout, and it's a cost to the district. So what Mr. McLaughlin did is figured out the actual dollars and cents of the person who's leaving, what it's going to cost us, and if we replace them at an average salary, what the difference will be. And so the perception is that you'd save a lot more money than that when people retire. But the reality is, you don't. Yeah, if That's like three hundred dollars, a little over three hundred dollars per retirement person. Right. So the uh, you know the common person would think people retire, a teacher would be making sixty-five thousand dollars. We're going to replace them with someone making forty. So bang, there's twenty-five thousand dollars savings. It doesn't work out that easy. Right. But even with the steps, I mean, are, are we, uh, so he, Mr. McLaughlin, actually took the teachers that we are losing specifically or the positions that we're losing specifically mm -hmm. and added that. Is it FTE retirements, are those teachers? Are those, I mean, for the five? These five position. are teaching positions. So well, they're teaching, teaching positions. And a principal, right. And a principal. Right. It's just amazing that we save so little to get rid of five positions. It is true. Now, remember, let me give you a little more detail on that. If somebody retires with a master's on level 13, 13 years of experience, okay? Uh, when we hire somebody, it's not that we hire them with a bachelor's degree and zero experience. You know, we looked at a trend of how we hire people, and we often hire people with their master's and two or three years of experience, sometimes up to six years of experience, because we are an attractive school district for people to work. So they are getting their three, five years experience somewhere else, getting their master's degree, and then when a job opens up here, they're applying, and they're outstanding candidates. And we want the best candidates, so we hire them. And it's not always at the bottom of the scale. A couple of the retirements are at the end of next year, so we don't get that benefit. They stay oh. on for the whole year, and they retire with maybe a month left. So you really do not realize any benefit. We still have to get a long-term sub in, or we have to make other accommodations, but you really don't get that savings. Okay. It just seems so small. It is. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> It's not, yeah, it's not eliminating the position, it's a retirement. And it's a position so we're and refilling all of those five, re right. five of course. positions? Of course, yeah. They're and, that, and that's only saving us 300 and something per, yeah, per position. Yeah, we just eliminate those positions. That'd be swell in terms of the savings, but then <laughs> we wouldn't have principals and teachers. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'd be really busy. <laughs> the, next line, the next line goes is one I can only do so much in a day. <laughs> yeah. You eliminated three literacy in intervention, those are, those and you save 145,000. Because it's the actual position. So right. all of those retirements are getting replaced. Yes. Okay. Yes, Mr. Zahowski. As a three-year veteran on the uh, budget and property, and in, in having gone over the the budget for those three years, I I find it so amazing that um, you can. Uh, find thirty thousand dollars in school materials and supplies to cut. You know, when when we looked at uh, those line items and cut them back, we were um, we were certain that we were doing with so many without so many things already that I, I really can't believe that we can go uh, to the school materials and supplies once again and, and find that savings. I, I trust that you believe we can, um, but I just find it really uh, shocking. Uh, because of the work that we've done in the past few years looking at that and in trying to find everything that we thought we could go without and ask PTOs and, and share through departments in order to, to find savings there. Uh, yeah, you're raising a very good point. We really can't. We can't cut $30,000 in materials and supplies because we have taken every dollar out of materials and supplies. And we will continue to lean on PTOs to help support our teachers with classroom materials. But when it's either live without 
highlighters, markers, and colored paper and scissors, or lay off another teacher, we definitely have to err on the side of preserving our personnel. And so I would just make one more point on that. I am concerned about the middle school reduction in the, uh, the world language position. Um, I think um, Ms. James speaking uh, this evening uh, really made some uh, pointed in, in true remarks. As a, as a world language teacher myself by trade, I, I understand the, the great benefits a student gets out of learning a world language. And um, coming from a district that doesn't start world language until the ninth grade, um, you know, I, I've always really um, admired Northampton for their commitment to at least keep it intact at the middle school, knowing that at one point we did have a FLESS program that was cut in the, um, in the elementary school. So it is concerning to me. Um, you know, we, we live in a global society. We ask our students to understand and have a worldly view. And um, one of those things that uh, we as as a uh, as a as citizens of the United States lag behind in is our ability to communicate in other languages you know we're really monolingual here in the United States whereas if you were to travel outside of the country you'd see um, students learning um, three languages is the norm and, and we you know I think we we really need to do the best that we can in our district to uh, get language learning into our students as soon as possible and as much as possible. So that is concerning. So I do share that concern along with um, my city councilor who did speak about that last week when we were in our joint session. Mr. Moore? Yeah, I'd like to make a, as long as, we're, as, long as we get to talk. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that's really struck me is, you know, we have very good schools and um, when you look at the budget, I think we have, you know, when you adjust for that, we have really pretty amazingly good schools. Um, the, the cost to, I mean, how that happens, the difference between what we pay for and what we get, we have good schools, but when you look at the cost, they're great. It, that difference is, is because of our staff and our administrators and our students and then you know, our two announcements at the beginning were both fundraisers for the schools. Um, the, the, you know, between the PTOs and the parents who support the athletics through their booster clubs, and the NEF, which is a broader community organization, and on and on. I think, you know, we've, we've, um, we're really grateful to them, but I think we really have to, uh, we have to really examine how we're doing this. I mean, we, we, we've sort of, you know, it's, it's sort of like our, our, our sites have been, in a way, sort of we're, acting, we're the, sort of the victims of things and we continue to sort of buy into that in terms of saying, you know, how much worse can it get? You know, how much less money can we get by on? And we sort of, you know, have started t taking that as being like what we pride ourselves on is how well we can do given less and less. And I think at some point we need to really start asking the questions, you know, which, which aren't on here anymore which were, you know, the pages three and four before of the other proposals, which is what do we want to do and what kinds of schools do we want to have? And these schools, they represent us and we also represent them. And um, it, it, we need to start thinking in terms of what kinds of schools do we want to have represent us and what kind of schools do we want to be representing, you know, when we're talking to other people around the state. Um, and I think we need to start really asking that question. And then that obviously comes down to the dollars and cents and what will we be willing to pay for it? You know, what kind of school do you want and how much are you willing to pay for that? And I think we need to really keep that conversation going. I mean, I don't know, you know, the various formats for it, but I think the longer strange one is I think we as a school district need to really come up with, and I don't know how it's done, but I know it has to be done just figure out a strategy for actually working with our state and federal government directly um, because otherwise we just continually do the thing of priding ourselves on doing really well with what um, what is an inadequate amount of money and I think that's not really the right approach I think the right approach is we have to figure out what we want to do put a price tag on it and a plan which is what the pages three and four did before and then figure out how we're going to talk to the people from whom we get the money 
about it. And I think it has to be something that we do. I think it, we make it like our summer project or something, as opposed to just waiting till next year and once again looking at these numbers mm -hmm. and once again saying, you know, the problem is, well, we know the problem. So we need to start working on the solution. And so that's my, uh, my, my word for that. Um, so specific and more general and, and kind of echoing what some of my colleagues have already said, so thank you. But um, So my, my two biggest concerns about this, my two most immediate concerns about this budget is one, what we've done to our ESP account because just historically we know we're going to have to replace some of those. And so it almost feels like, um, like a false savings because we, we just know that there's going to be something else that we're going to have to reduce as soon as we have somebody move into our district. So I'm concerned about that, um, and, and that, that happens every year. And we d we're not going to have much in the way of reserves to be going to this year. We've had less and less, um, but we really can't have that much of that. And I'm also very concerned about the, the language program in the sixth grade. Um, so my understanding of how this works is that there will be one less exploratory block in the sixth grade and so that the ones that they have will last for more weeks. Is that what will happen? I believe that's the plan. And so the exploratories of the sixth grade keep are it um, would be art and music and is it technology? And what are the what are the other ones that are being kept? D E. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. There's a there's a you know, it's a, what used to be called home Yeah. Family and consumer education. <laughs> there you go. And, and so d are we going from five to four? Is that what happens? And a computer thing. I said that technology. Tech. Well, Music there's also the technology tech. thing. You know, it's like the shop class technology yeah. as opposed to the computer. Is that sixth That's grade? Not. I thought that went, I thought I it was know. the seventh. Yeah. Anyway. Five to four with half of your cycles. So, so kids will get more art, more music, more tech, more um, computer, um, family, and family and consumer science. Um, so I guess one of the questions I would ask is how the decision got made to which exploratory to, to keep and which not to. Um, um, so I, I, you know, I'll, I'll put it up there that I would question why we're keeping family and consumer science in the sixth grade over language, which is something that is continued um, through high school and I think is so valuable. Um, so I think we still have time to look at these things, which is why we do. Um, so those would be my, my specific concerns. But more general, generally, I want to say two very different things. One is I want to commend you and your business manager for coming up with the budget. Um, I mean, it seems like year after year where, you know, you're asked, the superintendent's asked to do this impossible job and it gets done every year because that's what has to be done. And it kind of looks like magic, like, oh, phew, we did it, we, we, got, we got it done. But as Howard was saying, I don't want anybody to look at this and say, wait, we have a great budget. Because the great budget was on page four mm -hmm. and the really good budget was on page three. Mm -hmm. And this was what we have to make do with. And we're gonna make do the best we can with what we have the way we always do. But when people look at this, they're not looking at the huge list of cuts that we've made in staffing and programming year after year after year. And, you know, this is my 11th budget season, and if I were to, to come up with a list year after year of everything we've cut in 11 years, nobody would look at this and say, wow, what a great job we've done. Even though, logistically, you've done a great job of being able to put this together. <laughs> but it, it's, a sad, it's a very sad statement about where the priorities for funding um, in this, in the state and in the country are to me because we don't get enough and as Howard said, I really think that we're not doing a good enough job as a school committee of following through with our statements that we really need to be in touch with our legislators and make an, you know, an impactful statement somehow. We, we say that but we, we're not really doing it and we, I don't think we've figured out how to do it well. And I think that needs more examination. And the conference committee first came together hoping to do that. And you know, every time we, we delved into a topic just a little bit, it was um, frustrating because we kept meeting these roadblocks of where all the, um, the red tape is in, in state government and um, how little progress, you know, MAS 
agency has been able to make on something like um, um, charter school funding and all of that. And it's just every time we turn around, there's a roadblock of how we can't do as well as we want to for our schools. And then somehow we end up being penalized if we don't do well enough for our schools. Mm -hmm. um, and we are doing well. We have great schools here. My, my kids have, you know, one went all the way through and one is almost all the way through. And, you know, I'm, I'm not complaining about what, what my kids have gotten here. And I know with the talent that we have in our district that if we had increased funds, we would be providing so much more. That's not a critical statement about what we are providing. It's a statement about the evolving potential that we're not a, a being allowed to evolve. I do believe that it <coughs> actually evolves. Um, and we're, you know, we have evolving dreams and visions, even though we haven't been able to articulate it well, but, um, but we're not allowed to meet them because we can't get the funding that we need. So it's a, you know it's a it's a very difficult process. This, you know when people this is the time of year when people ask said you to enjoy being on school committee. It's like, not right now, not this month. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I love being on school committee, but I find this this part really disheartening. In spite of the fact that we're doing such good work and putting together a budget that meets the uh, requirements. If I may respond, uh, you describe the dilemma very well. Uh, and your feelings about the dilemma very well. I want to go back to the first part of your statement about world language, art, music, and uh, if you probably don't remember, you're not as close to this as I am, but one of our early uh, budget plans had art, music, and world language all on the budget, slated for cuts. And when the mayor was able to give us 208,000 additional dollars, which we very much appreciated, uh, we were able to make decisions on what to bring back. And so, principal is uh, involved in helping to create this list and there's not one thing on here we want to do trust me uh, <laughs> we have some interesting alt meetings lately <laughs> when this comes up uh, however w I believe one thing that drives these decisions is the schedule and how because we have to have kids in classes engaged in learning and so how we can schedule our kids also plays a part in how these decisions are made and if we can, if we cut 1.0 FTE in world language and the kids can still be in classes and learning, then that's going to have to come above. If we cut all of the art teacher, then there would be a gap in the kids' schedule and they would have nothing. So those kinds of subtleties in the schedule uh, sort of lead these decisions. What does it actually mean to cut, cut 0.4 at middle school in art? What, what do we mean? Well, uh, what it means is you take a uh, teacher who's here five days a week and that teacher will be here three days a week. But what does that do to how much art the kids are getting? Kids get less art for fewer days. So instead of, In and I don't know the details, but just an example would be instead of a student going to art twice a week, they'd be going to art once a week. So that's throwing the whole exploratory schedule right. for a loop really. Right. So Which is why the schedule eight, plays into that. that. Just in the sixth grade also? I don't know the answer to that. Six, right? I guess it would have. And unfortunately, when things like that happen, where if a 1.0 person cut down to 60%, we usually lose that person. And so we'll be out searching for a new part-time art teacher. And we don't love for that not to happen, but people need their salaries. I had a question about the, uh, the one of the strategic objectives on the district improvement plan is to the school committee and the superintendent will prioritize funding for technology in the FY13 budget by advocating for an additional three hundred thousand dollars for staffing and supplies. So I'm wondering if, if that how that is affected by this budget. These, these numbers that you just put in front of us. You know, I love that you brought that up and that you're a technology director because our technology director brought that up yesterday in our alt meeting and it's a very good question and my response to that is I'm not finished advocating for our schools. Uh, I'm not giving up hope. I'm going to continue to fight for money for our schools and what I mean by that is if I, you know, I want to take this all the way to the capital planning budget and continue to fight for technology for our schools. And there's got to be some way 
that we can realize the savings, whether we're going to combine our technology departments with city and school, or if we're going to just put capital expense money towards schools and technology. Um, I don't know the answer. I don't know how that's going to happen, but I'm not going to stop asking for it and fighting for it. That's good. Glad to hear that. We are, I mean, uh, we are planning to do a capital program. We are hoping that we'll have um, through turn backs in my current budget year and free cash that gets certified later in the year that we'll have some funding to actually be able to then run a capital take requests from the school department and fire department and police department and all the various agencies and then try to figure out what we're uh, and I guess if I could also just add, um, you know, I, uh, to the point you raised about the advocacy or I forgot who was raising it and that, that was one of the, um, in my budget message, that was uh, part of that, just the fact that we are not just the school but the city faces this continual kind of structural imbalance between, I'll quote it, between our ever-rising fixed costs and the lack of revenues to meet them. Uh, we must join voices with other cities and towns to ask our state government to provide us with either the financial resources or the local tools to adequately fund our public schools, our police, our fire, our infrastructure, and all the other vital services in our communities. I'm committed to working with the council, the school committee, city residents, and like-minded individuals in other cities and towns across the state on this effort. That's essentially the same issue that you're facing in the school budget. It's the same one we're facing in the city budget. Um, you know, for health care, when our rates are going up 7.5%, when uh, pensions, when um, uh, debt costs, uh, all those costs are going up, and we're only allowed to raise revenues at 2.5%. You know, that's every year we're going to run into that. So, so that's important. I'm willing to work with the school committee on it, but... But you're right, you know, I was at a transportation meeting today of regional transportation officials, and they were talking about how, you know, the House and the Senate are still, you know, haggling over, you know, transportation funding. And they may not get anything, or it may just be continued, or, I mean, so pretty much across the board and at the state and federal level, there's, uh, you know, this is an issue that's happening, not just in public education, but in all funding areas got to keep uh, keep keep keeping it on people's radars Are there any other comments or questions about the budget development yeah, just, just not on the budget development process on what you just got you're saying I, I think one of the most pathetic things I've heard over the last year is when people talk about how you know we sorry but we have to cut the funding for public education because of the difficult financial times. It's like, that's exactly the reason we need to support public education, it's precisely because it is the best way to educate our children in terms of as a cost-effective measure. And it's precisely because of hard economic, you know, economic times we need to be doing that as an investment, as a way to spend our tax dollars. And then I guess I would only say, final point is that in, in terms of my entire city budget, the, um, the there were the top three increases that I gave to various city departments um, uh, over above level funding. The number one was to the Northampton Public Schools, mm -hmm. um, was the 208000 uh, And then mm -hmm. number two was our veteran services budget. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think number three was either fire or overtime or what. But anyway, so I mean, I just I did want to. Though the 208 is not enough to fill the gap, um, it's the largest increase of any budget in the city. The police department was level funded. The fire department was level funded. Um, the school department was not. Level funded. So just that's all I want. Yeah. I just want to make sure that that's clear. You stated in an amount of money. Is it also uh, proportionately, or we, did we proportionately percentage-wise get the most money added to our budget in comparison to the others? I mean, we have the highest budget, so 208000 is could be seen as small or large. Well, the it's police got zero added to their budget. Well, I was wondering about the other two, about the other two that you stated. Uh, 
the veterans? Yeah, I mean, the veterans one is we're increasing it because we're required by law to provide the veterans benefits. Okay. So, so we have to provide those benefits. Um, and so we're increasing it so that we can actually meet the demand that we have each year to provide is, those benefits. Is that also because the state cut it, cut the benefits more? Uh, no, it's because um, we just have to mandate it. It's because we have a lot more veterans. Okay. Um, our, our country's doing a good job of creating veterans. I wish they'd stop. Um, I love our veterans, but I <laughs> wish they would, you know, so that's one of the issues. Okay. Um, and we want to take care of them and provide them the benefits they need. Um, and so I think, the, and then the other issue, um, the other one was uh, overtime on the uh, fire was fire overtime. Yeah. And, and again, we're trying to make that budget actually every year. We, on that budget, and then we have to try to figure out a way to, to fund it throughout the year. Kind of so like our ESPs? Like ESPs, mm -hmm. like snow and ice, mm -hmm. etc. Okay. And so we're trying to actually put in place a, a, a realistic budget. My final comment on the budget was that, uh, as you noted, as uh, Ed pointed out, uh, we tried to cut things before we got to the classroom, and once we had to get to the classroom, we went to the non-core academic classes to try to preserve our core academic class sizes, and uh, that was the methodology we used in making these cuts. Okay. okay. Um, any other uh, any other comments on that item? <coughs> if not, I'll ask for the um, budget. Property subcommittee report. Uh, budget and property met May eighth, which was just this past Tuesday. Uh, we had a few uh, items on the agenda. We heard from the athletic department. Jim Miller came in, and um, we had scheduled that to uh, see how things were going. If you recall, uh, several months ago, we had a lengthy discussion about raising user fees as a way to try to get that budget back under control. It was running a deficit last year, and um, through conversation with Jim Miller on Tuesday, seems as though it's going to be underfunded or um, come in the red again this year. Um, so we know the superintendent has made a recommendation to put $10,000 into the athletic uh, budget so that um, we cannot, uh, so we don't have to uh, continue to, at the end of the year, uh, move funds there to cover the budget. Um, Jim Miller has a responsibility in the athletic department to make sure at the end of the year the, um, you know, that he has a budget that, that does not operate in the red. Um, unfortunately, through the user fees that he takes in, the gate receipts that he brings in, and the sports that we provide at the high school, um, it's just really become impossible for for him to uh, to cover all the costs on on the user fees and the gate receipts. So, um, through the discussion, it was made clear that um, that money that the superintendent is asking for in the budget certainly is necessary and uh, it was evident through the conversation with Jim Miller. That was one thing we talked about. Um, also, superintendent shared with us the most recent budget proposal, which wasn't the one you saw tonight because he it's revised days it. went by. <laughs> <laughs> Two days, 48 hours can make a big difference as we saw. Um, so we had a little discussion about that. Uh, and then lastly, um, we spoke about the joint meeting that we had with the city council. Um, and we, we discussed a few things, um, and I'll share those with you. Um, one was that um, the subcommittee uh, agreed that we were all pretty surprised by the suggestion that came out of the meeting, which was uh, for an override. Um, we didn't believe that the intention of the meeting, the joint meeting, was um, uh, to meet with the city council and, and to ask for an override, but uh, we thought that the, uh, the joint meeting was more about discussing with them how our school services have been eliminated over the last several years and um, with the superintendent's uh, various um, budget proposals, uh, what it would cost to bring many of those things back. And um, 
so the subcommittee did not take a vote nor did it make any type of recommendation to bring back to the full school committee that um, we were going to be endorsing an override at this time um, I think our immediate concern and the thing to remember is that even if um, we were to ask the City Council to um, to uh, to put an override forward that's not going to uh, solve our immediate concern right now we're working with and looking at the FY 13 budget and that override does not impact that budget whatsoever um, so supporting an override right now isn't going to get us any closer to what we all want which is really to make sure that this FY 13 budget is most is the most educationally sound uh, budget that we can put forward for next year and uh, yeah, I think that's it Are there any questions about the report okay um, that we also um, when we were talking with mr. Miller sort of touched on the the, the rather uh, convoluted finances of, of the of the revolving fund and um, I believe that, that where we left that was that um, the superintendent we're going right. to I met with uh, work on trying to get that a little more regularized so I met with Jim Miller and Nancy Athos to go over the spreadsheets and the fine details of the numbers that were not able to be provided uh, Tuesday night and we would request to reconvene the subcommittee and give us another chance to present those numbers in more detail we had a technology a glitch in the athletic director's computer so uh, we have that fixed we have the reports and the spreadsheets for you and we'd like you to take a look at the details of the finances if you're willing to do that again sure so are you, are you looking for a date to convene or would, would uh, it just be June 6th or beforehand? Meeting, or can we do like the same meeting, oh, that one meeting with food services? It's June 7th. It's better not to do it at the same time as the lunch. I, th I think it could be a relatively short meeting. We could do it in 45 minutes, um, I believe, uh, based on what we saw today. June 7th. I would like to do it sooner. Uh, I felt, you know, I kind of feel like we fell short in providing the information that was necessary for the subcommittee and so we have that ready and uh, if we could do it sooner we'll try to of course work with your schedules and uh, I'll ask our school committee clerk to try to arrange that meeting if you're open to doing it before that so would we look towards next as early as next week well we work around baseball so right. You tell I me have one game <laughs> next week. You Tuesday, tell me when we so can meet. We can <laughs> I have I have Thursday. We don't need to do this. <laughs> yeah, we can do this off. Not we can do this off Tuesday. outside of the public meeting. Yeah. Not Tuesday, okay. We'll yeah. that. So the next. Uh, it, so I would just before moving on, I apologize just to to holl just to one one more time. So we we do have one more. Uh, we have that scheduled meeting June seventh, and that would be for the purpose of uh, looking at the um, food service and bringing in Carol tomorrow. Uh, because once again, that's another line item that the superintendent's calling for $25,000. We'd like to hear from her and to uh, once again hear from her the, the reason for that increase, the increase in food costs and everything else. So She'll be ready with plenty of reports for you. <laughs> I believe that we will have, be nearing the final draft of our budget book, which will be presented to the school committee on June 14th. So I'd like to have that ready for June 7th so you could have a peek at that before it comes to full committee. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, the um, next is a report uh, from Ms. Pick on the Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee. Okay. So um, we have continued to meet the Superintendent Evaluation Process Team is comprised of Those around. Um, um, Alden and Lisa Minnick and myself when we meet with the Superintendent. And it was part of his contract that we would have um, an evaluation tool in place that we all agreed to. Um, and you've hopefully read the minutes of our meetings so that you're caught up on some of them, but we have, we've had another meeting since that. Um, what we're passing out now is, um, is a tool that came from DC and then went through MASS. And just to explain some of it just very briefly, the, the big packet here has, um, it, it's broken into standards and then subgroup there and there are indicators and then the indicators <coughs> under elements and so we ha as a group um, have agreed on 10 different um, um, indicators 
to evaluate the superintendent on in this year. This is the kind of tool that's going to be used across the district for our um, administrators and teachers, but this is a, um, um, a superintendent rubric. Um, and the ones that we've chosen are highlighted in yellow, uh, so you can see those. And what we will be doing is um, evaluating, back up a little bit. This will be the first time that the Northampton School Committee is doing an evaluation process in um, public. Um, with the new open meeting law, this is now something that we are bound to do. It was a new law last year, but last year superintendent was leaving. We did not go through this um, process. This is the first time that we're doing this, and we're working very hard to come up with one, a tool that will be a, um, a good teaching instrument for the superintendent to guide him in making his, in setting his goals for the next year, but also being very cognizant of the fact that this is a, um, um, uh, we're doing this in a public forum and trying to be very um, conscientious about how to do that well. Uh, it's not something we've done before and we're being in touch with um, MASC for some guidance and um, just to, uh, to remind you that anything that we do as part of the evaluation tool, um, anything in writing becomes a public document and any discussion that will be held will be held in public unless it's a um, uh, <coughs> complaint or a personnel, uh, per a personal personnel item um, that goes to executive session. Everything about the evaluation process will now be in public, and this is a first for us. So we've, um, together with the superintendent, determined the 10 indicators within the elements, within the standards, that we're um, going to use this year. These can change from year to year, or they can remain the same. We'll be using a Likert scale. It's a four-point Likert scale. Um, unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, and exemplary. Um, the superintendent is, I think, um, um, very generous in the way that he's looking at this and that he wants to be evaluated the same way the people in our district are being evaluated. Um, and that includes that any um, evaluation of an unsatisfactory or an exemplary must be accompanied by a comment. So you can't just kind of check something off <laughs> and say, um, you don't want to write a comment, I guess you're putting them in the middle. But if you're going to be fair, we can just check. <laughs> you can just check, but you're certainly going to be um, um, encouraged to put as many school committee, the 10 of us. That sounds like the incentives are running. <laughs> Simmer down. This is the most important thing as far as I'm concerned the school committee does. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, I take this part really seriously, and, and for the past several years, I've been the one as the vice chair to compile the, the summary. Um, and so I, I do take it very seriously, and I really appreciate when school committee members take the time to really think about each measurement that they are evaluating on and giving the superintendent as much feedback as possible, um, whether it's positive or critical, but in a professional way, and to remember that this time that it's going to be public. Um, it, in the past, it's only been seen by the vice chair and the superintendent, um, but now this is public. so. Um, this is th this is what we're recommending is that we will be doing this um, four point Likert scale on these ten items that you write comments, and that it's being suggested this year that rather than the vice chair alone compiling the data, that this is something that this team would do together um, to assure everyone that the the summary is as objective as possible. Um, comments were you know were made in our discussion that. Um, is the vice chair and the superintendent work more closely together than most school committee members do, and um, it's very easy for people to think that a summary might be um, not more subjective than objective, and so um, we thought that we would open that up to the, the three members of the, um, of the evaluation team to do that. Um, in addition, we are looking at ways to include more than just the school committee in the um, evaluation process. And it was part of um, our initial contract with the superintendent, and it was a very clear public understanding that we would be looking to our administrators for, for feedback as well. And the superintendent has made it very clear that he would like feedback from, from not just the administrative team, but also from the staff, and um, eventually from the larger community. Um, we're trying to figure out we're still working on the on how much to open how quickly because we just we want to not go so fast that we don't know what we're doing and getting ourselves into and 
um, not so slowly that we don't give him as much information from as many people as possible. We're trying to set a new precedent this year um, for, for being very open in this process. Um, so we're talking about some sort of a um, an online survey tool that we would need to create that um, would be appropriate for administrators and, and all staff um, to fill out. Um, and we'll be working with um, technology to try to figure out how to do that in the most effective way and to come up with questions that will be most suited to the people who are filling that out. Um, and um, leaving room for, for anonymity where that's wanted, but being able to get some de demographics so that we know are we hearing from a middle school teacher or an elementary custodian, or are we hearing from an administrator, trying to get some information so that the superintendent understands where the feedback is coming from. Um, in terms of, I wrote notes and I haven't even looked at them. Um, our, in terms of our timeline, we're hoping to have um, this tool um, kind of drafted um, by our next meeting so that we can hand it out to a school committee member or just given to school committee members to fill out. Um, and we're looking to have responses back before the end of the school year, not just school committee, but whatever we're doing, so that we, we get people before they start leaving on summer vacations. And then the, um, the team will be compiling data and writing a summary during the summer and um, um, presenting that in our August meeting is what we're thinking so that the superintendent can sit down with us and formulate um, new goals before the school year starts. Do we, do we need to, as a committee, adopt this as our what we're doing for evaluation, or is that I don't know? I don't That's up proceed. to you as a committee. I believe that you charged us with coming up with the tool, but we're certainly um, wanting feedback. And I, you know, I know that it's hard to kind of go over this mm -hmm. right now. Um, but I guess what <laughs> I would encourage is for all of you to carefully look at the highlighted items and. Um, I would ask you to get in touch with one of the three of us, um, me, Alden, or Lisa, um, um, before our next meeting, which is, did we come up with a date? June 6th, I believe. Let me just make sure so that, that sounds familiar. Okay. Uh, I wonder if I have it with me. Yes, June 6th. Um, in a, with some advance notice so that if, we, if there's something really glaring for you that we're not covering in terms of evaluation, measurement or something that you think that's in there that you really don't understand that you'd be in touch with us about it but also remember that all evaluations that you fill out you are, um, have more than ample opportunity to write as many comments on these measurements or anything else that you want the superintendent to know um, about his work here in terms of setting goals and moving forward I was just going to add that um, I mean it was, I think it was challenging for all of us looking through all the possibilities <laughs> And seeing a lot of these things, I mean, one of them is um, communication. You look at that and you think, well, of course, it's super to be able to communicate well. And so, by not by not choosing that, we're not saying we don't think communication is important. But in terms of limiting the list to what we really want to focus on and focus the superintendent on and the district on moving forward, these were the ten that we're we're suggesting. So that's kind of how we develop that. I would say. Thank you. And I, I would just like to say that I really. Um, this is where, where my relationship with the superintendent is not so objective, but I really want to commend um, the superintendent for, one, for embracing this whole public approach and for asking for as much feedback from as many um, parts of the community as possible, and two, for, for agreeing to use as many evaluation indicators a, as we are. We could have chosen less than 10. Um, remember that for every one that we choose, he has to write a goal for it because this is what we're doing in the district now. People are writing their own goals that we then will go over with him. Um, we could have said he could have said, yeah, "I'm not doing more than the six. <laughs> but he he is he works hard. He's very motivated to try to um, you know to to meet our needs and the needs of the of the school community and the larger community. Um, he's working as fast as he can, and I, I just really want to acknowledge that and appreciate that. I just wanted to second that, that um, I admire the fact that you are undergoing the yourself to the same scrutiny that the teachers are and that it, 
it's an open public forum and that you have not chosen in any way to shirk any of those same evalu evaluations. And I just, I admire that also. And I want to thank you for setting yourself up to that high standard and for being open about it also. So I second Stephanie's. Thank you. Mr. Meyer? Um, so you referenced the fact that often in terms of evaluation, one of the difficulties is having the data to evaluate. In an educator evaluation, before the classroom evaluation, there's a pre-conference where a number of the aspects of the teacher's professional activities are addressed in the conversation with the principal. For instance, what do you do to stay current with the subject matter in your field? What professional development activities have you undertaken? So I'm just wondering in terms of structuring this, are you considering the superintendent providing us all with evidence of, of his activity in these <coughs> particular areas, or even giving a presentation as part of the evaluation process? So that we basically are sitting down with you on that, with that evaluation and saying, please explain to us, and obviously to the community, what you've done within these areas. And, and I, I just think that's more valuable in some respects than us individually trying to gather that data from different sources and, and then really not evaluating the same thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're having an interview, you know, an interview, a direct interview, we're all hearing the same thing and acting on the same data and we all have the ability to follow up. I know that's, you know, some, some more onerous for the superintendent. It produces a different task, but it might make it more meaningful in terms of our input. Can I address that? It's my plan put together a portfolio of artifacts and evidence in each of these indicators and to make the presentation to the subcommittee and to the full committee um, my work in each of these areas so that you can better uh, assess my work. Okay. I would also say that we've been getting information all throughout the year from the superintendent in terms of his weekly musings and what he shares here to the superintendent's reports about what he's doing in the district and out and um, you know, if you if you look back on those and, and think back on the amount of communication that we've gotten, I think that we're going to be able to answer these questions mm -hmm. um, um, with a, with some thought this year pretty well. Um, and then, you know, ongoing, yes, we have that those particular goals in his mind as he is giving superintendent reports, and making sure that we get that information. Are there any other uh, comments about the report on the? Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee. Okay. And the uh, final report of the evening is and from. I'm sorry, could I just find? Sure. If, I, if we don't, if the three of us on the committee don't hear from you before our meeting, I'm going to make the assumption that you're comfortable with the with the indicators that we've chosen. And and just to reiterate, um, all of the indicators are important. There isn't a single one that isn't. We chose the ones that we thought were really important to focus on right now, knowing that we can. A add or subtract as we need to. Yeah, I mean, in later years we can focus on different things, right? It's not that we don't hear about the other ones. Right, right. I would just say one, I was wondering if I was going to say anything about this, but I think <laughs> I will just, sure. just to prolong the evening one more minute, but only because we just had some professional de development as, um, as teachers this past week. We're looking at um, a, a similar rubric, if you will, um, as we start getting ready, ready as teachers to be evaluated uh, with the new system. And we had some discussion around the idea of pr being proficient. And I heard Mr. Moore say something about, you know, that kind of being the, the, the quick check. But, you know, after a, a lengthy discussion, uh, and if you look at the word proficient and what it means, and if I could just read this, proficient, synonyms are adept, skilled, and expert. And so when we're looking at that proficient area to maybe evaluate our superintendent as, uh, I don't want us to at all think about that as being average or that, you know, if it's out of five, that number three. It's really a, a high mark uh, to say that our superintendent would be proficient because if a synonym is an expert, we certainly want our superintendent to be an expert. Um, and also, if you, if you look at the, the definition, right, having an advanced degree of competence in an art, vocation, profession, or branch of learning. 
And so it is a high mark. And to, to look at the exemplary, we would like to think that every person would touch upon one or some of those. But a proficient mark is something more than just an average mark. And, it, and I would expect all of us to, to think of that and see it in that light too. Thank you, Ed. And I just want to say that when, you, when these are printed out for us <laughs> by our clerk, that you will get this whole rubric and you won't just get the four words to check off. You will get the definition of what each of those means as it's written here. So it will tell you uh, for each indicator what proficient actually and what it actually means or, or what needs improvement or exemplary or, or unsatisfactory. So you're really going to need to read these and take some time with it. And the superintendent deserves us to take that time. This is in my opinion, the most important thing we do. I was going to say, I mean, I think that's part of what the state is trying to get at with this, right, is that one person's <coughs> proficient could be another person's unsatisfactory, so they want kind of we're comparing apples and apples, so. If you remember, or for those of you who have done yeah. these, these with us yeah. before, our, our old Likert scale didn't use these words. It had more to do with meets expectations, exceeds expectations, and, you know, Blue, what are your expectations compared to Andrew's, compared to mine or to anybody else's? If somebody didn't exceed my expectation, that doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't mean they're bad. my expectations were off the wall and nobody could exceed them. So this is more measurable. This is more, uh, more of a definition and more objective. Okay. Uh, are we all set <laughs> then with the regular report? Okay. So then the final report is from um, uh, school committee person, Boo Duvall, and it's a report about on the hill. Um, on March 27, I went to um, the State House in Boston for the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Day on the Hill. Um, the focus was effective advocacy for education, um, especially for unmandated, unman unfunded mandates. Um, their legislative priorities included adequate and equitable distribution of Chapter 70 school aid local and regional transportation, charter school finance reform, full funding of education circuit breaker, funding to support education for mobile students, strengthening the children's services safety net through interagency collaboration, a couple more. relief from excess excessive regulation, accountable virtual schools, and school committee approval for school improvement plans. The um, there were speakers both from the Massachusetts Association of School Committees as well as the co-chair and the, on, um, the Joint Committee on Education and the vice chair on the House Mean Ways and Means Committee, Representative Marty Waltz. They stated that we're, the regular un education is underfunded by $1.6 billion here in Massachusetts and that we need to find ways as a school committee to become leaders and become powerful local representatives for effective lobbying. And that was a lot of what they had to say was that I brought a couple of extra copies. I brought one for Superintendent Salzer and one for the chair, co-chair, assistant chair. And then I have one for anybody. David, um, Mayor, you can have one if you want. Okay. And also, as well as that, I passed out um, the Massachusetts uh, 2012 State Legislative Directory. They suggested lobbying letters and phone calls to our legislators, but also to not overdo our lobbying and to develop relationships with our legislators. And the legislators themselves stated that a lot of the reason that some more of the money was directed to more affluent school systems than they had previously anticipated was a direct result of lobbying and that we as individual communities all need to find ways to lobby for ourselves. Um, but primarily, how do we set the most appropriate guidelines to get kids to graduate and be well educated? And that was the bottom line and that's what we are trying to do here within our district. But they did suggest that we do need to really get together an organized effort of lobbying and to take it to our wards and to our counselors and have the counselors take it and, and have it be citywide. And the legislators themselves who had a great, we had a great lunch um, by the technical schools, all the different technical schools in the state. So we had a variety of lunch and the legislators came and a lot of them came and ate with us and talked with us and, and said that 
you know, they really enjoy, want, need to hear from people. And I would kind of equate that to being on the school committee here and really appreciating and wanting people to contact us and let us know what it is that they want. I think that we need to do that in a more organized way. And the other thing is that um, the idea of virtual schools and um, they suggested that all the different districts look at the idea of virtual schools and see if we can have any online classes and that would help take away the crowding of the school rooms and all sorts of different things, but also be able to get kids to possibly take college level courses in high school online. So that was another thing. And then there's a safety, um, a school safety and anti-bullying conference that is in Orlando, Florida. So if anybody wants to send anybody, <laughs> I volunteer. Any questions? <laughs> Uh, I mean, did they have any, did they have any, um, I, mean, I think as you indicated, it, it'd be great for, for Northampton to focus on this stuff, but it, it seems like to really have an effect, they've got to hear from a bunch of different towns. Do you think that's true or no? I mean, because what you're really talking about is kind of changing the overall formula is not just kind of funneling more money to Northampton, right? Sort of. Basically what each one of them said was that the, um, Greasy wheel, squeaky wheel gets the grease, uh -huh. and that it's not it's not all or nothing. That if you have a community and you lobby to pick out what is important and lobby for it, um, right now they're just not funding. They have mandates, but they're not funding the mandates. And so possibly to try to get them to fund the different mandates that they're stating, um, stating like the evaluations and the administrative costs that go along with those. They're interested in hearing from all the different communities. In fact, a couple of the legislators that weren't even from my, I didn't even meet our legislators. I didn't see them anywhere there, but that didn't really bother me that much because I would rather meet them here and meet right. other legislators. And they said that, yes, write to your own legislators, but if you really believe in something and it's going to be an effective you know, lobbying tool, write to other legislators too that just aren't your own. And that's why I passed out this long list of you know everybody that we could write to. But um, basically, we need to find effective lobbying efforts. And they do believe that that matters and that it works. Okay. Are there any uh, questions or com additional comments? Um, I just have, I mean, could I ask one? So well, what do you think is like a, would be a good game plan for these that been through? No, I haven't thought that through, but I've always thought that we need to get a committee or something uh -huh. th that's um, based with citizens and people who are active to be able to state our goals and what are our, our utmost goals to, to be lobbied so that yeah. we're not all over the board with the lobby. Yeah, we probably pick like one or two key mm -hmm. things. That's what they, yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. Just, I mean, it seems like <laughs> in, it's the kind of thing that we could just kind of Sounds great, but could you kind of just disappear um, into the... It says, research, research your legislators' backgrounds, committee assignments, and voting records on their issues. Develop relationships with them um, by making advocacy a year-round commitment. Don't overdo the lobbying. Only write when you have something important to say, and then write to everybody. Invite your legislators to visit our schools and um, plan a tour of one of our more successful schools, that's all of them, to show successful programs in action. Um, we need to lobby with real life experience as far as how it affects each of us. Set priorities. And they said when everything is important, nothing is important. Uh -huh. And then we do get our allies w from within our community and use the media. And of course, always be polite and courteous. In politics, there are no permanent friends and no per permanent enemies. And pat your legislators on the back for what they do well as we get them to work for us for what we need. I want to thank you for representing the school committee at this conference and providing the report back to us. So you know, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Are there any other um, uh, old business items that we need to address? I don't see any on our agenda. Any new business items? Are we meeting later this month or is that meeting canceled? I'm 100% clear yet. The whole committee meeting? The May 24th. It's looking like we may not need that, but I would save the date. So we'll hear if it's okay. Okay, um, the only other items are the future business and meeting dates, rules and policy, meets on Tuesday, May 14th. Uh, excuse me. Okay. 
Tuesday is not. Okay. Tuesday is the 15th. So it's the end. Um, so I'm not real sure. Tuesday is the 15th. That no. meeting was yeah. in the process of being rescheduled. Yeah. Right. It was moved from Monday the, the 14th till Tuesday. So yeah. Maybe. Okay. So uh, I guess Tuesday, uh, May 15th. Uh, late school start for Jackson Street School is Thursday, May 16th. Thursday is not the 16th. Wednesday, May 16th. Wednesday, the 16th. Yeah, I Thursday is the 17th. Wednesday, the 16th. Yeah. <laughs> it's around then. <laughs> but the next one is Thursday, the 24th. <laughs> we will take care of these errors. So I'm just reading as I see him yep. here. Yeah. A school yep. committee meeting is Thursday, May 24th. That's Perfect. Tentative, that okay. Uh, that's tentative. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this one I know I can't get wrong. Budget and property to be determined. It's actually June 7th. Yeah. Oh, it's June 7th. <laughs> for oh, June 7th. We're going to have another one sooner, right? <laughs> so we're going to have another one sooner. That's right. fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so that completes the future business meeting dates. <laughs> Second. Uh, the adjourn has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned.